You know, scientists make discoveries that change the world, but even they can face mysteries. Here are 10 things that have baffled scientists. Imagine that you constantly hear a low-frequency hum, and no one can trace its source. Roughly 4% of the world's population hears the hum. It's a geography-free sound. I mean, people all around the world hear it. So the name varies from Taos hum to Auckland hum, depending on the region where it gets generated. The sound is just on the threshold of human hearing. People hear it less when they're outside, and it gets louder indoors, especially at night. What's even scarier is that you cannot unhear it once you've heard it. Some folks say it started in London around the time of Charles Dickens, who wrote A Christmas Carol, and the low-frequency sound actually comes from the humbug. <laughs> or not. Actually, the earliest cases were recorded in Bristol, UK, dating back to the mid-1970s. Scientists have various theories about where the hum comes from and why only some people can hear it. Yet they don't have a clear answer. It could occur when ocean waves move along the ocean floor. They shake the Earth when they collide with continental shelves. Or this might be happening because of volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. Oh, and how about ultra-low frequency radio signals used to communicate with submarines or even 5G? Hmm. Upsweep is another type of unidentified sound. It was discovered in 1991 in the Pacific Ocean. The sound is high enough to be recorded throughout the ocean. Scientists theorize that the sound could be related to underwater volcanic activity. Interestingly, the volume of the sound has been diminishing compared to its volume when it was first discovered. Yet it still can be detected. Plus, it's seasonal. It reaches its highest volume in spring and fall. Is it related to seasonal changes? No one really knows for sure. The next mysterious thing is a cone-shaped monument found in the Sea of Galilee in Israel. This monument was discovered accidentally by sonar scanning in 2003, but the findings were published only in 2013. The monument weighs 60,000 tons. It was once submerged by rising waters. Archaeologists say the monument is enigmatic because they can't figure out where it's from. They don't know what it's connected to or its function. So this big and unusual thing remains a mystery. Now let's move to Gobekli Tepe, Turkey. This place offers you one of the most archaeologically significant sites in the world. Why is it important? Well, it has massive carved stones about 11,000 years old. To put it in perspective, they're 6,000 years older than Stonehenge. Ancient people placed these stones before they began farming or crafting metal tools or pottery. So the existence of this place goes against the chronology of civilization we're familiar with, where people farmed first and built second. Apparently, it wasn't like that. In any case, a good question is, what was the purpose of this site? Was it built to worship some spirits? Yep, archaeologists believe it might be the world's oldest temple. Okay, say this with me. Paleodiction notosum. Yeah, I know, it sounds like a chemical formula. This is a living fossil found deep down on the ocean floor. A creature makes these hexagonal burrows, that for sure. Yet scientists can't identify the artists. Now, what do I mean by living fossil? Well, Paleodiction notosum is a creature believed to produce a burrow nearly identical to Paleodiction fossils. Is it a worm-like animal that made them? Scientists don't know. One thing is clear, this isn't some random stuff created by geological forces. Now speaking of fossils, take a look at this giant one. Its informal name is Godzillius. It was discovered in 2011 by an amateur paleontologist. This is a scientist who studies the history of life on Earth by analyzing fossil records. Anyway, back to Godzillius. It's almost 7 feet in length and 9 feet tall if you were to measure it upright. This fossil is 450 million years old, coming from the time when Cincinnati was underwater. It might be a fossilized algae mat, but some scientists have different opinions. This is a massive tunnel found in South America. The tunnel is at least 8,000 to 10,000 years old. At first, researchers discovered a couple of colossal burrows. They were enormous and neatly constructed. Geologists were amazed, saying they had never seen such structures before. 
there's no known geologic process to explain their formation. I mean, researchers have known about the burrows since the 1930s, but back then, they believed that these tunnels were just some sort of archaeological construction, until they discovered huge claw marks on the walls and ceiling. They reasoned that some extinct species could be the ones to have left these marks. Many geologists strongly believe they found the burrows of giant ground sloths and armadillos. The structure is the largest known burrow from the Paleolithic age in the Amazon. Yet experts have many questions. How come such a deliberate-looking structure could form naturally? A researcher then discovered another strange cave. This one was hundreds of miles away from the massive tunnel. Fast forward, there are now more than 1,500 burrows from the Paleolithic age found in Brazil. What's even more interesting is that some of these caves are connected to tunnels that sometimes lead to chambers. I'll continue with a natural phenomenon. What if I told you that every year, especially in October, fireballs appear on the Mekong River in Thailand? According to legends, Naga fireballs are a call for Buddha to return to Earth. And river serpents are the ones making these calls. Well, that's a myth. But what does science say about it? Is it related to a flammable gas? There are no clear answers yet. These fireballs appear to rise from the water. They can go as high as almost 990 feet. They're like fireworks, disappearing rapidly. They typically glow with a reddish or orange color. I'll mention some legends too, because why not? They're thrilling. And it would be a shame not to include the one about the lost city of Atlantis. As you may know, the legend says that Atlantis submerged into the ocean around 11,000 years ago. Since then, not just scientists, but also treasure hunters and philosophers have been searching for the lost world. Could Bimini Road be a trace? In 1968, a diver found strange stones off the coast of North Bimini Island in the Bahamas. The stones look human-made. It's like they were evenly spaced out and laid in an orderly row. It baffled scientists, but not for long. Carbon dating analysis of the blocks revealed that geological forces created the road naturally. There weren't any tool marks or signs indicating that the blocks had been stacked or something. The research is continuing, but yeah, scientists generally believe that the rocks were created by erosion. Well, I guess the time of Atlantis hasn't come yet. Okay, picture this. You're wandering on the beach, and you see dozens of octopuses walking past. In 2017, a group of people from Wales witnessed exactly this. Why did these creatures come out of the ocean? No one knows the answer. The group reported that they had seen 20 to 30 octopi crawling on the sand. The people looked for some signs of injury, but found nothing. They said that they had carried the animals back to the ocean. Interestingly, these creatures kept crawling onto the shore when people were asleep. Experts say that it's hard to be sure of the reason that pushed the animals to the beach without conducting a physical examination. They're still speculating about the reason behind this unusual and rare occurrence. Could it be overcrowding? Furthermore, the octopi were (laughs) well-armed. A separate study points out that the more fishers hunt large animals that feed on octopuses, the more the octopus population grows. Maybe that's why these creatures have to go farther to find food or shelter. But without proper research, these are only theories. There's a lot we don't know about space, too. So here's a bonus fact about the yellowish source of life in the solar system. Scientists have discovered a new type of wave inside the sun. These waves move in the opposite direction to the sun's rotation. Plus, they move super fast, so fast that it's beyond our understanding. Researchers have different theories about the function of the waves. If they figure out their role, this could give them additional insight into the processes happening inside the sun. And yes, the octopi were (laughs) well-armed. In November 1922, a boy walked through the desert mountains of Egypt and discovered some ancient steps carved into the rock. Subsequently, this find became one of the world's largest and most significant archaeological discoveries. This step was part of Tutankhamun's untouched tomb. Archaeologists found about 5,000 ancient objects, including jewelry, fabrics, painted vases, and funeral masks. 
you've probably seen one of them. It has become one of the most recognizable attributes of ancient Egypt. More than a hundred years have passed since then, and now humanity has finally become close to another large-scale discovery, the tomb of Cleopatra. This queen was the last active ruler of the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt, who sat on the throne from 51 to 30 BCE. There are many ancient records about Cleopatra, her reign, and her unusual personality, but until now, no one has discovered the secrets about her passing away in the burial place. So, one archaeologist, Dr. Kathleen Martinez, has been studying ancient records and temples around Alexandria for decades, and concluded that the tomb of the queen should be located under the ancient city of Taposiris Magna, founded in 280 BCE. It was a big city on the northern coast of Egypt, where tens of thousands of people were engaged in trade and industry. And it seems that Dr. Martinez's guesses turned out to be correct. She and a group of archaeologists have discovered a secret underground tunnel near Alexandria, with a length of about 0.8 miles. It was cut into the rock under Taposiris Magna's temple. During further excavations, they found many things that indicate Cleopatra's tomb lies in the tunnel's depths. It's also possible that she is buried there together with the Roman commander, Mark Antony. According to ancient records, Cleopatra and Mark Antony loved each other and together opposed the Roman Senate, which declared Antony a traitor. The fact that natural disasters have occurred on the territory of Taposiris Magna for thousands of years can complicate the excavations. Earthquakes and floods destroyed the city and possibly flooded its underground tunnels. But archaeologists hope the ancient tomb remains untouched and that it hides many treasures and records about the royal life of ancient Egypt during the reign of the last dynasty. There's a chance that excavations will go underwater and in the mud. This will require much time and funding, but archaeologists are sure it's worth it. Anyway, it's too early to say that Cleopatra is really buried there, but scientists have found many things in the tunnel that confirm this, including clay pots, dozens of coins with the image of Cleopatra and Alexander the Great, as well as a bust with the image of the Egyptian queen. Cleopatra is still one of the most popular personalities in Egypt, on an equal footing with Rameses III and Tutankhamun. She inspired many films, paintings, and books. But what made her so popular? She became famous for her inconsistency. She was a beautiful, intelligent ruler who pulled Egypt out of the crisis and made it a prosperous power. Medieval Arabic texts say she knew chemistry, mathematics, and philosophy, and may have written several scientific books. She knew several languages and had excellent diplomatic skills. At the same time, there are many legends that she was a femme fatale who drove many men crazy. However, there's no evidence that her beauty was incomparable. The image of a stunning model was created by Hollywood when it made several films where famous actresses performed the role of Cleopatra. And the Roman Emperor Octavian, the adopted son of Julius Caesar, specially created the image of Cleopatra as an insidious seductress because he was her enemy. Even though she was born in Egypt, Cleopatra wasn't an Egyptian. Her ancestors were Greeks, among whom was one of the generals of Alexander the Great. However, the people of Egypt loved her. She learned the language and was very sensitive to the traditions of this country. She knew the history, mentality, and customs of ancient Egypt well. She raised the level of its economy and strengthened its status as a world power. Much of this was made possible thanks to her cunning and impressiveness. She loved theatrical performances and lavish celebrations. She knew how to surprise people and put on a show. But behind the exterior image of a luxury lover was an intelligent and calculating ruler. Ancient Egypt was a rich, luxurious country, and Cleopatra did everything to increase its wealth and strengthen its position in the international arena. For example, she was once in conflict with her brother Ptolemy XIII Og. The queen knew that she wouldn't be able to resist him, so she decided to attract Julius Caesar to their side. The Roman Emperor arrived in Alexandria, where Cleopatra wanted to meet him. But Ptolemy knew about her plans and was about to prevent her from coming to Caesar. Then, instead of a rich and noisy arrival, Cleopatra decided to make her visit inconspicuous. 
She wrapped herself in a carpet or linen bag the emperor's servants carried into Caesar's private chambers. Cleopatra emerged from the carpet and impressed the Roman emperor with her beauty and determination. As a result, they fell in love with each other and became close allies. After some time, she impressed another influential Roman for diplomatic purposes. She arrived to meet Mark Antony on a golden barge with purple sails and silver oars. Cleopatra was dressed in the image of Aphrodite and sat under a magnificent canopy. Her servants dressed like cupids and were blowing her fan and burning incense. But Cleopatra created such a show for a reason. She knew that Antony revered Greek mythology and considered himself the embodiment of Dionysus. As a result, he was so impressed with this woman that he ended up marrying her. Cleopatra defended her crown, strengthened her alliance with Rome, and bore Antony three children. In Egypt, they threw big parties and enjoyed wealth with power. However, the relationship of a high-ranking official with the Egyptian queen caused a scandal in Rome. Octavian was Antony's primary opponent in the struggle for power, so he exploited the situation to darken the competitor's reputation. He used propaganda to make Cleopatra an insidious seductress in the eyes of Roman citizens. He accused Antony of succumbing to her charms. The Roman Senate supported Octavian and declared Cleopatra an enemy. In 33 BCE, this conflict reached a high point when Antony's navy clashed with Octavian's fleet. The latter won and forced his enemy to flee to Egypt with Cleopatra. According to some records, they took refuge near Alexandria. Pursued by the Romans, they hid in one of Cleopatra's palaces and met their end. Some legends say that Cleopatra was an expert in poisons. She provoked a venomous snake, a viper or an Egyptian cobra, to bite her. Also, according to another legend, she pricked herself with a poisonous needle. There's a theory that Cleopatra always carried an ampule with poison inside her hairbrush. And when she was cornered, she soaked the needle with this poison and pricked herself. None of this can be said for sure. Scientists are still trying to find out the truth. Perhaps when they reach Cleopatra's tomb, the world will get more answers about her tragic fate. She is considered the last ruler of Egypt. After her passing, Octavian plundered her palaces and temples and returned to Rome, where he became the main emperor. He successfully ruled the country and expanded its borders. His reign ended when he turned 75. World history would have looked different if Cleopatra and Mark Antony hadn't lost that naval battle. By the way, did you know that more time has passed between Cleopatra's reign and Neil Armstrong's flight to the moon than between the reign of the Egyptian queen and the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza? Armstrong took a step on the Earth's satellite in 1969, 2038 years after the birth of Cleopatra. And the construction of the pyramid took place in 2560 BCE. Imagine how long the history of ancient Egypt is. Cleopatra is closer to us in time than to the pyramids. Let me take you to a place that seems to be out of this world. Life inside this cave has been isolated from the outside world for about 5.5 million years. And it does show. See for yourself. Due to such a long isolation, the conditions inside the Mobile Cave are like nowhere else on our planet. A unique ecosystem is flourishing there, even though there is a severe lack of sunlight inside the cave, and the air is toxic. The cave, located a few miles west of the Black Sea in Romania, was first discovered in 1986. Nowadays, you can only visit it if you have special permission. Plus, the central caverns are guarded naturally by narrow limestone tunnels and vertical shafts. So, if you're no stranger to claustrophobia, you'd probably better not enter this place. In the depth of the cave, the air has twice less oxygen than the air outside. Instead, it contains a lot of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, so not the freshest air you can breathe. It's also pitch black inside the cavern. But despite, or should I say, thanks to, this cocktail of extremely harsh conditions, the site is a true goldmine for biologists. Shockingly, life seems to be booming here. In a 1996 study, scientists identified 48 species, and 33 of them were unique to the cave. Most of the creatures inhabiting the cave are tiny, with long limbs and antennae that help them navigate in the dark. They have no vision and lack pigment, and it makes sense. Why would you need to be able to see if you live in total darkness? And why would you need to be pretty and colorful with no one to see you? Now, I'm going to take you to another cave. It's no less amazing, but looks very different. 
This is the giant crystal cave, aka the Cave of the Crystals, in Mexico. These ginormous crystals were found in 2000 by a mining company after the water was pumped out of the cave. Two miners then saw the crystals after entering the drying cave on foot. These awe-inspiring crystals are actually massive gypsum pillars hidden 984 feet underground. They're anchored to the walls and the floor of the scorching hot cave. Scientists estimate that the crystals could have been already growing for half a million years. That's why many of them are so long and wide that you can walk across them. Unfortunately, visiting this wonder of nature is impossible at the moment. But maybe it's for the better since the giant crystal cave is a dangerous place that can easily turn into a trap. For tens of thousands of years, it was filled with groundwater, which was originally pushed upward into the opening by a magma chamber located in the depths of our planet. The magma under the cave kept the water hot, but eventually the temperature of the water dipped below 136 degrees Fahrenheit. As a result, the water started to fill with calcium and sulfate, whose particles began to recombine into gypsum. And then, white tinted crystals took over the cave. And since they stayed underwater, they were able to keep growing. You don't have to fly to space to take a closer look at a black hole. Scientists have found something very similar to black holes in the Southern Atlantic Ocean. A black hole has such an enormous gravitational pull that once something gets pulled inside, it doesn't have any chance to escape. Even light can't get out of a black hole. But ocean black holes seem to be almost as powerful as their space relatives. But instead of catching the light, they do the same with water. Ocean eddies are massive whirlpools that spin against the main current. They usually swirl billions of tons of water and most of them are larger than a city. These whirlpools are so powerful that nothing trapped by them can escape. But the scariest thing is that you might not even notice heading into one of them. These things are so huge that you won't spot their boundaries until it's too late. When scientists started exploring ocean vortices with the help of satellites, they discovered the borders of several eddies. After that, they managed to prove that, mathematically, these whirlpools are the same as mysterious black holes in space. Massive eddies are surrounded by super tight barriers where fluid moves in closed loops. Even water can't get out from the inside of these loops. That's why tight ocean vortices play the role of enormous containers. Water inside them can be totally different from the ocean surrounding an eddy. And I'm not only talking about its temperature. The salt content inside and outside a whirlpool often differs as well. On the thin Curonian spit splitting the Baltic Sea from the Curonian Lagoon, there is one of the most bizarre places on Earth. Locals call this area the Dancing Forest because pine trees in this forest have shockingly unusual shapes. They twist in spirals and circles along the ground. There are some theories why it could be happening, of course. Some people claim that huge amounts of positive and negative energies once clashed in that spot. More down-to-earth individuals believe that the reason is geological. Sandy soil in the area is too unstable to hold trees growing upright. The most popular is the idea that strong winds blowing from the water influence the shape of the trees. In any case, experts haven't come to the final conclusion yet. Look at these underwater crop circles. For the first time, they were spotted in 1995, close to southern Japan's coast. Local divers called these seven feet wide structures mystery circles. The enigma had been plaguing many mines for almost 16 years until the culprit was finally caught. Imagine the researcher's surprise when it turned out to be a male pufferfish. The fish needs a bit more than a week to build one circle, and the aesthetics are obviously crucial. A male is swimming inside the circle, digging valleys in the sand with its fins. But that's not all. The fish also use shells and corals to decorate particular parts of their circles. This whole build a circle thing has a practical purpose as well. The way a male fish swims pushes the sand toward the center of the circle and creates a mound which later serves as a nest. The next mystery on our list is in the Caribbean. Just off the coast of Belize, there's a giant sinkhole. That's the Great Blue Hole. It's about 1,000 feet across and more than 400 feet deep. Once, a long, long time ago, this hole was a cave. But then rising waters filled it, making it collapse in on itself. The deeper you'll descend into the Great Hole's crystalline waters, the darker it will become. You'll see tons of stalactite-filled caves there, but entering them is extremely dangerous. 
unless you want to get hopelessly lost. Once you reach a depth of 50 feet, you'll notice that the water is shimmering. That's the invisible line dividing the sinkhole's salty top from the freshwater abyss. You might want to turn back right now. Who knows what you might come across in the murky depths. There was an old Amazonian legend that told about the river that was so hot that it boiled. And it was believed to be just a legend until Peruvian geoscientist Andres Ruzo questioned if the river could be real. All experts denied such a possibility. After all, hot rivers do exist, but only in the areas where there are volcanoes. As for the part of the country mentioned in the legend, there are no volcanoes in that region. But Andres Russo was too dedicated to give up. And in 2011, he finally located the river from the legends. The water in it was indeed steaming hot. Its temperature was 186 degrees Fahrenheit, not boiling, but pretty close to this point. But what shocked the researcher the most was the size of the river. One could think that the almost boiling water was the result of the activity of an underwater hot spring. The thermal pools are always small, while the river is 20 feet deep and flows for almost four miles. This is the only river of its kind on our planet. Have you ever wondered why mountains seem so still and silent? Well, prepare to be amazed because these majestic landforms have some hidden talents. You see, mountains are actually quite the performers. They have their own unique songs and dance routines. What does it mean and how does it work? Well, let's see. Get ready for a chilling revelation. Mount Everest has a secret nighttime symphony, and this mysterious music will send shivers down your spine. When darkness falls over the Himalayas, a strange eerie chorus echoes through the glaciers surrounding the majestic peak. A team of researchers embarked on a quest to unravel the mystery. Led by the glaciologist Evgeny Podolsky, they trekked through the freezing temperatures of the Nepalese Himalayas. Their goal? To uncover the source of these hair-raising noises. The team was amazed by the incredible size and beauty of Mount Everest. During the day, the weather was nice and they could work comfortably. However, when night came, it became extremely cold reaching temperatures as low as minus 5 degrees Fahrenheit. At that moment, something interesting happened. The ice on the mountain started to break apart and make loud booming sounds that echoed through the valley. To solve the mystery, the team used advanced technology that is typically used to measure earthquakes. They placed sensors on the surface of the glacier and listened to the vibrations it created. They also looked at information about temperature and wind. By comparing all of this data, they made a very important and exciting discovery. The culprit behind this frozen orchestra? It's the sudden decrease in temperature. The icy surface of the glacier is very sensitive to these changes, causing it to crack and split with loud booming noises. This discovery helps scientists understand how glaciers behave in a world where climate change is becoming more pronounced. This adventure is really important because it gives scientists who study glaciers and the climate in faraway places like the Himalayas very valuable information. The melting of glaciers in that area is happening really fast. And that's a big problem. It's a serious threat to South Asia. A recent research shows that the glaciers have been melting 10 times faster in the past 40 years compared to the previous 700 years. But this isn't the only reason why mountains can make strange noises. Other mountains might also sing their own songs. For example, Mount Matterhorn. Guess what? Everything around us has its own special rhythm. Objects vibrate at certain frequencies because of their shape and what they're made of. You've probably seen it before with tuning forks and wine glasses. When they're hit with the right frequency, they start shaking and making sounds. But here's something cool. Even mountains have their own groove. They vibrate in their own unique way. Jeffrey Moore and his team of adventurous scientists wanted to find out if mountains can dance to their own music, just like bridges and tall buildings. They thought that the special shapes of mountains might make them vibrate at certain frequencies, which is called resonance. But testing this idea wasn't easy. Unlike buildings that engineers can shake or bridges that vehicles can drive over, mountains are massive and hard. It's hard to make them move on purpose. Not giving up. Moore and his team took on a big project. They wanted to study how the shaking of the earth affected the famous Matterhorn Mountain. 
This incredible mountain is located on the border of Italy and Switzerland. It looks like a pyramid. It's really tall, reaching about 15,000 feet high. It has four sides facing north, south, east, and west. With the help of helicopters, the scientists put special devices called seismometers in specific places on the mountain. One was placed at the very top and used solar power to work. It was as small as a coffee cup. Another seismometer was tucked beneath the floorboards of a cozy hut on the mountain, and a third one was placed at the base of the mountain to compare the measurements. Together, they were the tiny observers that kept recording the movements of the mountain all the time. And they finally detected it. Even though the mountain's movements are incredibly small, scientists discovered that the Matterhorn gently sways back and forth about once every two seconds. What's truly surprising is that the top of the mountain moves up to 14 times more than its base. The Eiffel Tower kind of does the same thing. This giant iron structure is a pro at handling windy days, and when a storm blows through, it's not afraid to show off its swaying skills. It's like the tower is saying, hey wind, bring it on. But the reason behind the mountain's movement isn't just wind, as it may seem. So why do mountains do that? Why do they dance and make a humming sound? Are they having a party that we're not invited to? Well, it's all because of something called seismic energy. When earthquakes happen in different parts of the world, their energy travels through the earth and causes the mountains to vibrate. The oceans also join in this mountain music. When waves move across the ocean floor, they create vibrations called micro -seisms. It's like the earth's own heartbeat felt all around the world. And guess what? The frequency of these vibrations matches the way the Matterhorn sways. It's like the mountain and the oceans are chilling together. So the next time you see a mountain, remember that it's not just standing still, it's actually part of a global symphony created by the Earth itself. This research helps us learn how earthquakes can affect steep mountains that are prone to landslides and avalanches. It also gives us a new way to appreciate mountains like the Matterhorn. They have their own hidden songs, swaying and vibrating to a mysterious melody deep within the earth. But there's one more pretty cool thing about the mountains. They don't just talk themselves. They may also influence the way we talk. Turns out, languages spoken in high altitude areas have special sounds that you won't hear elsewhere. After studying 567 languages, linguists found that 92 of them use a special kind of sound called ejectives. These sounds are made by pushing air out forcefully from the back of the throat. This creates bursts of speech that give these languages their distinctiveness. Scientists were really surprised by this connection. These sounds, like a strong K and Ka, are not common in English or European languages. But some indigenous languages in North America and the area between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea have them. What's even more puzzling is that Tibetan languages, spoken in mountains, don't use adjectives. Linguists are curious to unravel this mystery and learn more about how mountains and language are connected. So, why do some languages spoken in the mountains have special sounds? Well, it's a bit of a mystery. Researchers have some cool ideas. One idea is that these sounds might help people keep their throats from getting dry when they talk in the dry air of the mountains. Another idea is that the lower air pressure up there makes it easier to make these sounds. But scientists are still figuring out the real reason. Although some experts are not entirely convinced by this explanation. They say that while geography can influence language, there are other reasons why languages might be similar. Like borrowing words from nearby languages or being close to each other. But this research has still given us some amazing insights. Mountains not only shape the way our world looks, but they also shape the way we talk. So the next time you're exploring a mountainous area, listen carefully to the local language. You might hear unique sounds and words that are influenced by the mountains themselves. It's like nature is sharing its own special secrets through the language of the people who live there. And remember that the mountains themselves also have a voice, and they're speaking to us in their own special way. Scientists are still on an exciting adventure to uncover their secrets. So let's see what are some cool things they'll find out in the future. Stay tuned. The Earth has three main layers, two parts of the core, the dense, hot inner core, and the molten outer core. Then comes the mantle. 
and then follows the thin crust, the surface that supports life as we know it. At least, that's what we thought. Because now, scientists found a new mysterious layer located deep within the solid inner core. Earth's inner core is approximately two-thirds the size of the Moon. And made of nickel and solid iron, it's burning hot. The temperature at the center of our planet is the same as at the surface of the Sun. The outer core can reach almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's difficult to explore it because we can't go there. And it's like looking through a really dirty window of 3,200 miles of molten metal and rocks. But we can rely on laboratory experiments on heated pressurized rocks, signals from seismic waves, and computer models. When an earthquake hits, it sends out seismic shock waves. Those waves travel through layers at a different speed, depending on the direction they go and the material they move through. In the new study, a team of scientists set a data set of 100,000 deep earthquakes. Some of them went over 60 miles below the surface. When an earthquake happens on one side of our planet, scientists track its waves all along to the other side. Waves change when they come to the other side, so scientists try to understand the materials these waves have passed through. They found a new layer in the core of our planet thanks to earthquakes. Normally, shock waves travel along the equator, but down below, they digress and go into different directions, about 60 degrees to the side. When waves pass through the inner core going from north to south, they will travel more quickly than waves going through the core parallel to the equator. It's important to understand the core because it creates our magnetic field, which, in turn, protects the planet from things like solar winds that are charged particles coming from the sun. In the 1960s, we discovered the Earth pulsates every 26 seconds. It's like clockwork, a giant heartbeat. The ground is slightly shaking, but we mostly don't feel it. Researchers can still track it. Some of them think the continental shelf comes as a huge wave break under the oceans. For example, the highest part of the North American continent falls off into a deep abyssal plain. One theory says waves hit this spot, producing regular pulses. It's like having all kinds of drums. You hit them with your hands and accidentally slam that one spot that produces the right harmonic bang to rattle our entire planet. If this theory is true, we're lucky there are no more spots like this that can shake the Earth. Other scientists believe the pulsation happens because there's a volcano near the critical spot. The island of Sao Tome in the Bight of Bonny. You're walking, running, and jumping, but when you stop, it always feels like you're standing still. In reality, you're moving even when you're perfectly still because our planet is always on the move. Depending on where you're at, you could be spinning through the universe at more than 1,000 miles per hour. If you're on the equator, you'll move the fastest. Let's say you have a basketball spinning on your finger. Check the ball's equator. A random point on it has farther to go in just one spin than any point near your finger. That means the point on the equator is moving more quickly. The Earth is a planet that recycles all the time. The ground we're walking on is recycled. Our planet's rock cycle turns rocks of one type into another. That's a cycle that goes on and on. The depths of our planet are filled with magma. As magma is going out onto the surface, it hardens into rock. Tectonic processes like volcanic activity, earthquakes, mountain building, and all of the other processes that shape the surface of our planet bring that rock to the Earth's surface. When the rock is on the surface, erosion shapes it and shaves its bits off. Those small particles then get deposited. All the pressure coming from above compacts the particles into sedimentary rocks, like, for example, sandstone. Sedimentary rocks can also end up deeper and deeper under the Earth's surface. Since there's a lot of heat and pressure, they get cooked into metamorphic rocks. They can go back to the surface once again, or even end up being re-eroded. Sometimes the crust plates are pushing one under another, and this way, rocks can transform into magma once again. We've explored only 5% of the ocean so far. The ocean itself, as well as life below the seafloor, is still a mystery. 
The sediments that are underlying our oceans are home to different microorganisms that exist even at depths of 1.5 miles beneath the sea floor. There are microbes hidden deep inside volcanic rocks below the sea floor off of the parts of the Pacific, hidden under 870 feet of sediment. The biosphere under the seafloor is growing extremely slowly compared to life on the surface. Cell division happens every 10 to 1,000 years. Something's different about the Earth's axis. Climate changes and melting glaciers, mostly in the regions like the Himalayas and Alaska, made the axis shift. Our planet has two kinds of poles. Are the south and north magnetic poles? They affect they affect things such as drift and navigation. The axis that the Earth is spinning around is another kind of pole. It shifted a little bit over time, but we don't know exactly why. Researchers realize there are moving masses of water, pushing the Earth's axis eastward. Take a basin of water as an example. If you're moving it back and forth, sloshing makes the water move its weight all around. A similar thing is happening on a planetary level. No matter how large an earthquake is, no human could ever feel an earthquake on the opposite side of the Earth, although some people claim they did. In 2013, there was one near the Kuril Islands with a magnitude of 8.5. It went around 400 miles deep. It was so strong, people in Australia reported they could feel the ground shaking. The strongest earthquake happened in Chile, in 1960, with a magnitude of 9.5. The rupture zone stretched from 311 miles to almost 620 miles along the country's coast. Earthquakes with a magnitude of 10 or higher can't happen. The magnitude depends on the length of the fault where it occurs. The longer the fault, the bigger the earthquake. A fault is a break in a part of the planet's crust. It has rocks on both sides, and they move past each other. We haven't found a fault long enough to generate earthquakes with a magnitude of 10 or more. If it happened, it would extend around most of our planet. An earthquake with a magnitude of 12 would require a fault larger than our planet. One side of our planet is getting colder than the other. The Earth has a system that keeps it warm from the inside, a red-hot liquid interior deep below the surface. It spins and, at the same time, generates a magnetic field and gravity. That way, the Earth's core holds the atmosphere closer to the planet's surface. The Earth also absorbs heat from the Sun, mostly on the surface. The heat doesn't spread equally on all parts of the Earth. One side of the planet, the Pacific Hemisphere, is losing heat more quickly than another, the African Hemisphere. This happens because land traps more heat than the surface under the ocean. The seafloor is way thinner than the land mass. Also, the temperature caused by the heat coming from inside the Earth is getting lower because of huge amounts of cold water above it. Clouds are not just like some fluffy distant pieces of cotton. They weigh more than a million pounds and help regulate our planet's temperature. If you take all the water droplets in clouds and bring them to the surface, you could cover the planet with a liquid layer as thin as a human hair. It doesn't seem like a lot, but this water is crucially important for climate. We'd have warmer temperatures if it weren't for the clouds. You're strapped in a boat cruising down the Amazon River with the sun scorching hot. As you check out your map, your boat starts rocking back and forth. The water is starting to get more intense, so you hang on for dear life. You tuck your map in your pocket and try to take control of your boat. You strike some jagged rocks and duck low to avoid tree branches. Your boat strikes a large rock out of nowhere and capsizes. You're swimming in the murky green water. While you're trying your best to get ashore, your boat gets washed away. Underneath the water lies a whole new world of bizarre and dangerous animals. Kandiru fish are snake-like creatures that can grow up to 16 inches long. Arapimus can weigh more than an adult male and are taller than most basketball players. They're the biggest freshwater fish in South America. They have a hybrid gill system that forces them to pop up to the surface every 5 to 15 minutes to breathe in oxygen for their large swim bladder. 
You swim out of the raging water and dry yourself off. Oh no, your map is completely soaked. There's no way you can get to your destination without it. You venture into the thick rainforest, shoving the branches and leaves away. As you get deeper, you notice something on a tree. It's barely moving, but it's got sharp claws and a raggedy coat. It stretches its arm to another branch and tries to pull itself up. Ever so slowly. Sloths sleep more than half their days and only head down from trees once a week. They're so motionless, they sometimes grow algae and moss on their fur. The rainforest gets denser with each step until there's barely any sunlight illuminating the path in front of you. You notice a figure following you. With every branch you step on, you can hear a faint sound right next to you creeping around. You start walking a bit faster and the sound catches up with you. You make it out of the dense part and tread along a narrow path until you reach a cliff. You can't walk normally here, so you pin against the wall and walk sideways to cross the hills. You slowly move across with the river 30 feet below you. You move your right foot and some rocks fall into the river. You keep going and misstep. You're about to fall, but you hold on to a large tree branch and pull yourself up. You notice a couple of colorful poison frogs inches away from your fingers. Touching any of these frogs can be extremely dangerous and harmful, despite their amazing color patterns. The golden poison frog is one of the most poisonous animals in the world. One of them hops right next to you, so you let go of the branch and fall back in the river. The river is washing you down until you reach a calm current. Underneath you is a swarm of piranhas swimming with their sharp teeth. The red color on their skin is unmistakable, so you swim off like an Olympic athlete. Piranhas will eat anything that gets in their way, no matter the size. You grip onto a log and climb up a small rock to catch your breath. There's a huge electric eel underneath the rock. Despite their name, they're more related to catfish than eels. They use their powerful 600 volts of electricity to defend themselves and catch food. You're stuck, unless you're like the common basilisk that can run on the water like a jet ski. These incredible lizards have special webbing on their toes and can run the distance of a basketball court. You hop on a bunch of rocks until you reach the land. You continue walking along the riverbank until you come across a moving rock. You rub your eyes and see it moving again. It's a dinosaur-looking turtle that resembles a crocodile with armor. The Mata Mata is a freshwater turtle that disguises itself with its surroundings to catch prey. Their heads stretch longer than their bodies. You shimmy your way past it and continue. You head back into the rainforest and find a spot to rest. Wait, there are giant ants everywhere! They're the biggest ants in the world and can produce one of the most painful stings out there, even comparable to a wasp's sting. You immediately get up and find another place to rest. As you continue walking along, you notice the same feeling of something following you. You can hear some leaves rustling, but it's getting dark and there's no way of telling. You find a nice little spot to build a campfire and catch some Zs, but in the Amazon, everything is a threat except for those cute capybaras wandering around. They live in groups next to water sources. They're also the biggest rodents in the world. You don't need to worry about them if you're stuck in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. Suddenly, you feel something slithering up next to you. You look down and see a massive green anaconda just about to constrict you. They are the heaviest snakes in the world and can grow up to 20 feet long and have a huge appetite. You get up and sprint your way out of there. All right, you found a decent cave to crash in. It's daytime again, and you're still alive. You continue walking along the rainforest. You were able to find some breakfast to boost your energy for the rest of the day. You spot something on a tree that looks like a branch, but it's actually a potu, a master of disguise that can spend days motionless on broken tree branches. These bizarre birds use those branches as their permanent home, where they lay their eggs and chill all day. You continue your way through the rainforest and see a Brazilian wandering spider crawling on a tree branch right in front of you. Eight of these species can be found in the Amazon area. They are some of the most aggressive and venomous spiders out there. So you make a big detour and walk away from it. 
You feel someone walking next to you again, but you still can't figure out what it is. You see a steep cliff with a waterfall hitting a large lake ahead of you. Looks peaceful. Until you see a team of black caimans gathering around the shore. They're the biggest predators in the whole Amazon ecosystem and feed on anything that moves. It's a good thing you're on high ground. Otherwise, whoa! You slip and fall down the river right on the deep end. So far, no caiman spotted you. You swim underwater and try to get to the opposite end of where the reptiles are. As you climb out and dry yourself off, you notice some large black spots on you. You try pulling them off, but they've latched on pretty hard. The Amazon giant leech finds its target by tracking movement and shadow. Once they attach themselves to the skin, it's extremely difficult to extract them. The best way to do so is to slide your finger next to its mouth and pull it off slowly. Ugh. You manage to get them off your body and see that the caimans are swimming towards you. You're pinned to the wall with the lake of hungry reptiles approaching. Suddenly, a pink dolphin jumps out of the water and splashes all over them. They can grow larger than humans and are the celebrities of the Amazon. Scientists think they get their color from the blood capillaries on their skin. The Amazon even has bull sharks swimming around. These carnivorous giant fish are threatening to humans and can swim in both salt water and fresh water. These sharks prey on anything within their reach, including other sharks. The dolphin distracted the caimans, so you climb up the cliff and try to find the best way to escape. Opened jaws waiting for you to fall into the pit are right below you. You're lucky enough to escape to the top, but as your arms pull you up, the first thing that you see is a jaguar looking straight at you. It's the creature that's been following you this whole time. You get up while it starts circling you, timing its strike. You know that you can't take on a jaguar, nor can you outrun it, so you grab a large tree branch from the ground to defend yourself. It jumps at you, but you duck down in time. The jaguar lands in the water far away from the caiman crocs. It's a good thing these large kitties are excellent swimmers. You pick yourself up and continue. And to your surprise, you find your boat again. You fix it up and sail your way out of the Amazon. Whew. Okay, let's play a little guessing game, shall we? Can you name the sixth largest river on Earth in terms of volume? That's the amount of water that flows through a waterway. The first couple of rivers are easy to list. Number one, of course, is the Amazon River in South America. Then we have the Congo in Africa and the Ganges in India. Feel free to name all the rivers on the planet. You won't get any closer to the answer. Why? Because this river is not on the surface, but underneath the waves of the Black Sea. In 2010, a team of scientists discovered this river while studying the Bosphorus Strait in Turkey. Sonar scanning revealed a channel at the bottom of the Black Sea. The channel had water flowing through it. It turned out that, at places, it's 115 feet deep. That's three times as tall as your average telephone pole. This flow of water acts like a real river. It has rapids and waterfalls, and its volume is 350 times greater than that of the River Thames in London. Huh, talk about a strong undercurrent. If it was a surface river, it would really be in the top 10. Bad news for the Madeira River in Bolivia and Brazil, the present number six. But how did this underwater river form? The answer lies in the amazing features of the Black Sea. It gets its water from two main sources. The first are the rivers that flow into it, like the Danube, Dnieper, and Don. <laughs> a lot of Ds there. But more importantly, they are all freshwater waterways. On the other side, quite literally, there is the Mediterranean, and it's salty, like a lot. When this salt water gets inside the Black Sea, it goes straight to the bottom. You see, fresh water is lighter than salt water. This creates stratification. It's a fancy term that simply means that the two types of water don't mix together. Salt water has a higher density, so it drops right down to the bottom. If you want to see how that works, you can do an experiment at home. Pour mineral water into one cup and salt water into another. Table salt will do. Then put a grape in each cup. You'll see how it immediately sinks to the bottom of the cup filled with fresh water. 
The grape will stay afloat in the cup filled with salt water. The same thing is happening inside the Black Sea. But there is another side to this phenomenon. The upper layer of water is rich in oxygen. This means it can support life. The bottom layer, however, is anoxic. Yep, you guessed it. This means there is no oxygen at the bottom. But this isn't a bad thing. Because of this trait of the Black Sea, shipwrecks are able to survive for centuries. Oxygen decomposes wood. And from what material did the ancient people make their ships? That's correct, timber. Recently, in 2018, scientists discovered the oldest Greek shipwreck on Earth. The merchant ship lies more than a mile deep at the bottom of the sea. Experts estimate that the vessel is 2,400 years old. The wreck was valuable for historians to study all the elements of ancient ship construction. From the mast to the rowing benches, it's all intact. The wreck lies some 50 miles off the coast of Bulgaria, but no one has seen it in person. Explorers sent a deep-sea ROV, or remotely operated vehicle, to film the wreckage. It was impossible for a diver to go down. Hmm, but the Black Sea doesn't look that huge on a map. Could it be that deep? Oh yes, it's way deeper than people think. You could stack six Empire State Buildings at the deepest point of the Black Sea, around 7,257 feet. This inland sea isn't the only place on Earth where researchers have discovered shipwrecks and underwater rivers. One of the largest channels running along the ocean floor lies off the coast of South America. It runs from the mouth of the mighty Amazon and into the Atlantic Ocean. Studying underwater rivers isn't an easy task. The depth and the strong currents make it impossible to send in divers. Even the equipment for underwater research has to be sturdy. Otherwise, the current will just wash it away. That's why the underwater river in the Black Sea was ideal for scientists to explore. Earth's oceans and seas are powerful. But, lucky for us, there are places where divers can admire underwater rivers. Ever heard of a cenote? Sounds Spanish. Well, that's because it is. Cenotes are underground caves. They form after the limestone above collapses, revealing the groundwater under them. The term cenote is associated with the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Ancient Maya used them as water sources. In the Mayan language, the word cenote meant sacred well. Researchers estimate there are some 10,000 cenotes spread across the Yucatan Peninsula. You can also find them in other places, such as Cuba and Australia. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but unofficially, the most beautiful cenote is located just south of the town of Tulum in Mexico. The name reflects the cave's divine beauty, Cenote Angelita. But people don't visit this cenote to go swimming. Its bottom is much more interesting. A scuba tank is all you need to finally admire an underwater river firsthand. The waters are dark and foggy, so divers use powerful flashlights. After a hundred-foot dive, a marvelous sight appears. An underwater river with trees along its banks. Some of them even have green leaves, just like any other water flow on dry land. But it's not really a river. Here comes the fascinating part. Remember how salt water and fresh water don't mix? Well, the river the divers see is actually a thick layer of fog between the two types of water. Three feet of hydrogen sulfates, to be exact. This is the compound that water processing plants use to remove chlorine from drinking water. The substance is so heavy that the fog it produces moves independently from the surrounding water, and it creates an illusion that a river is flowing underwater. But there are other real rivers that play tricks on you. Take, for example, the Mystery River in Indiana. It's the longest underground river in the United States. Explorers discovered the river and its cave system, Blue Spring Caverns, in the 19th century. Nearly three miles of the river are navigable. Isn't that impressive? You can book a boat tour on a river that you can't even see. But the most mysterious river on the planet is the Saraswati River in India. The coolest part about it is that 
it doesn't exist. It was an alleged river only mentioned in ancient literature. For centuries, people thought that it was just a myth. Then satellite images showed that it might be real. Ancient texts spoke of a major confluence of three mighty rivers, the Ganges, Yamuna, and Saraswati. The first two are visible today, but where's the third one? That's what scientists decided to find out. Images from an American satellite showed the presence of underground water in the area. Until then, researchers thought that these were paleo channels. This simply means that water flowed through them a long time ago. But to their surprise, it appeared that there was still water inside these channels. Scientists estimated that the Saraswati River flowed above the ground some 5,000 years ago. But it didn't dry up completely. It just went underground, some 200 feet below the ground. Local experts believe that the river still slowly flows into the sea. The Saraswati River got hidden under the desert sand. This was a natural process, but many rivers have been forced underground because of human activity. In London, England, several dozen small and medium-sized rivers now flow under the ground. Maps from the 19th century still show them as rivers, but today they only exist in the names of the streets that were built above them, such as Fleet Street. The same thing happened in New York, but this doesn't mean that these streams have disappeared for good. When engineers want to rebuild or modify a building, they still consult city maps from centuries ago. No one wants a long-lost brook to flood their basement. The Amazon River travels through nine South American countries at a length of over 4,000 miles. Still, it's impossible to cross it by a bridge. With the river being the main highway, traveling through this dense forest and so few areas populated around the river, there's just no reason to have one. The river can rise up to 30 feet, and the river crossings that were only 3 miles wide can expand to over 30 miles in just a few short weeks in certain spots, making a bridge nearly impossible to build here. In New Zealand, in the coastal town of Mauraki, there are huge spherical boulders. Some rocks are 6.5 feet tall and weigh about 7 tons, as much as 10 cows. Ooh, there's a 10-cow boulder! Maori legend has it that these rocks are from the remains of the goods from a large shipwreck that happened hundreds of years ago. From a more scientific perspective, it's sand and gravel combined to form these giant boulders. Waves and winds give them a smooth, round appearance over time. The whole process might take millions of years. Indonesia's Kaiwan Ijen volcano is famous for a stunning turquoise-colored lake sitting at the top of the peak, but don't dip in. It's an acid lake. But its scariest part is the sulfuric gas is leaking out when lava flows freely, reaching temperatures hotter than 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. When those gases come in contact with the air, they combust into a spectacular electric blue flame. That's why the volcano has blue lava. The island of Surtsey, south of Iceland, was formed over 50 years ago by a volcanic eruption. It all began back in 1963, when a powerful volcanic eruption created one of the youngest islands on the planet. All sorts of bacteria, fungi, and molds began taking over the island, leading to numerous other animals finding their way here, like seals and birds. Birds and ocean waves deposited seeds all over the island. Sadly, the island's getting smaller now because of water and wind erosion. Located off the coast of Brazil, there's an island called… Yeah, I'm a bit rusty on my Portuguese, so here it is on the screen. It looks perfectly untouched and pristine. Bad news? Dangerous snakes overrun it completely, so take a doctor with you in case you want to go there. Over 4,000 of the Golden Lancehead Vipers inhabit this island. These 3-foot-long snakes are among the most venomous in the entire world. Yeah, I think I'll skip that. Landing down under, you can see the Opera House. Uluru, lots of kangaroos, and catch the strangest wave of the world, wave rock in Western Australia. It's not made of water, but stone. It can be up to 50 feet tall and almost 300 feet long. It's especially incredible after rains in winter, when the Western Australian wildflowers fill up the entire landscape. In Atlanta, there's a world of Coca-Cola museum. The formula for the secret recipe is in a large security vault, heavily guarded at all times. Only a handful of people can get through those vault doors. 
Since its creation in 1886, the company has kept it a secret for only the most honest employees. In 2006, a former worker tried to sell the formula to Pepsi, only for Pepsi to call the police and inform Coca-Cola. The polka dot legs is a must for anyone who is in British Columbia. After the summer's scorching heat evaporates the lake's water, it leaves behind yellow, blue, and green water spots. These pools are full of all sorts of minerals, like sodium, calcium, and magnesium sulfates, that get concentrated in the pools. You can't get too close or even dip your feet into them. A fence protects the entire lake with a sign about how culturally and ecologically sensitive the area is. In Death Valley, California, there's a mystery of the sailing stones. Since the early 1900s, the mystery of how all these stones were seemingly moving by themselves across the desert floor baffled everyone. Some believe that the rocks move by thin pieces of ice around the stones pushed by winds after winter. No one ever saw any of these rocks moving until 2014. Scientists set time-lapse recorders, and the footage showed the rocks sliding along the ground over time. The marble caves in Chile, located in the beautiful area of Patagonia, formed from over 6,000 years of waves wearing down the rocks. The crystal blue walls reflect the vibrant turquoise water, making it perfect for kayaking. Walking in Chestnut Ridge Park in New York, one can see an eternal flame. What makes this one stand out, though, is it's underneath a waterfall. Occasionally, the flame will go out for short periods, but it will light up again. Sometimes it's thanks to certain hikers along the way. If you ever stop your car on a magnetic hill in New Brunswick, Canada, you'll see the car might start rolling backwards up the hill all by itself. While it looks like it's moving the wrong way, this is just an illusion. There are several hills like this all around the world. What looks like an incline is the opposite, all because there's no horizon for perspective. The brightest bioluminescent bay in the world, called Puerto Mosquito, is located off the coast of Puerto Rico. The bay is named for the pirate Roberto Cofrisi and his small boat, El Mosquito, not after those annoying insects. During the summer months, you'll have glassy water at night with millions of tiny microorganisms bumping into each other and emitting blue light. The Chocolate Hills in the Philippines is a group of unusually shaped hills located in the middle of the island of Bohol in the Philippines. There are 1,000 to 2,000 discovered so far. They have nothing to do with chocolate at all, but they resemble the color after the dry season, when the grass turns from green to brown. In the northeastern part of Thailand, 466 miles away from Bangkok, is a 75-million-year-old rock formation sticking right out of the mountains. Their shapes look just like a pod of whales swimming together. No wonder this place is called Three Whale Rocks. Millions of years ago, this area was just a desert, but this land has changed quite dramatically during this time. These sandstone mountains were lifted up by plate tectonics, that's the shifting of the crust layers, called lithosphere, and erosion by the Mekong River, resulting in the strangely shaped rock formations we see today. Salar de Uni in Bolivia is the world's largest salt flat. At 4,050 square miles in size, it's twice as large as Grand Canyon National Park. After winter has passed, the Salt Lake is transformed into a beautiful giant sky-reflecting mirror between September and May. With salt all the way to the horizon, it creates an illusion of endlessness. The thin layer of water left over from ice melting creates a shimmering effect of the sky, making it one of the best places to visit in the world. The Catambo River in Venezuela might be the stormiest place in the world, with nearly 300 storm days a year. The lightning storms are so consistent, and they're predicted three months in advance. During the wet season in October, you might see 30 lightning flashes in a single minute. At sunset, strong winds flow around the three surrounding mountains, forming storm clouds over the water. When the water droplets of humid air collide with ice crystals from the cold air, the static charges cause a lightning storm that happens nearly every night. Off the southern tip of Japan lies the Yanaguni Formation. Archaeologists believe that the monument belongs to a fabled Pacific civilization, like Atlantis, that vanished beneath the waves thousands of years ago. If it's truly a lost civilization, or just nature having a little fun, this is the site to dive into. Features inside the structure resemble stonework, like castles, temples, and a stadium, connected by roads and what seems to be large walls all the way around. 
there are even marks in the stone that appear to show quarry work, faded faces, and rocks sculpted into animal shapes. Some scientists believe that the symmetry of the stones is not as straight as reported. It appears solid rock rather than carved blocks weathered down by all the water over many years. Plitvice Lakes National Park in Croatia is an interconnected chain of waterfalls, the tallest being 230 feet, and underground water channels, creating natural dams and lakes in such a picturesque environment. Found in the deep woodlands surrounded by meadows brimming with wildflowers, brown bears, gray wolves, lynx, deer, and plenty of rare bird species for bird watchers call these 115 square miles of the National Park home. Imagine a place that could literally start at one end, trek over 1,800 miles straight to the west, and still be stuck under that massive canopy. This place is like a haven for all sorts of crazy creatures, hosting around 10% of the world's species. It's always been seen as this wild, untouched paradise where humans haven't messed things up yet. You know, like a glimpse into how the world used to be before we spread like wildfire across every continent, causing chaos everywhere. I'm talking about the Amazon region. That massive jungle turns out to be hiding some seriously cool secrets. For centuries, people have been talking about these lost cities deep within the forest. We're talking about El Dorado, the legendary city of gold that had Spanish explorers going crazy, venturing into uncharted territory never to return. And even in the 20th century, the adventurous Perry Fawcett went looking for the lost city of Z and disappeared into the jungle, leaving us all hanging. Scientists have actually found evidence that ancient cities did exist in the Amazon. But how did they find these hidden ruins in such a dense and remote forest? Well, they've got this awesome technology called LIDAR. Basically, they hopped into a helicopter and used light-based remote sensing to digitally strip away the canopy and reveal the ancient ruins of a massive urban settlement around Llanos de Mojos in the Bolivian Amazon. The place was once home to the Kasarabi culture, which thrived from 500 to 1400 CE. They had these incredible urban centers with huge platform and pyramid structures. They even had raised causeways connecting different suburban-like settlements spread across miles and miles of land. These guys were seriously ahead of their time, and they had an epic water control and distribution system with reservoirs and canals. So yeah, the Amazon rainforest wasn't just some untouched wilderness. It was actually heavily populated and even urbanized for centuries before recorded history of the region began. But the thing is, a bunch of people turned a blind eye to the fact that there were actually some pretty cool architectural sites lurking around here that totally deserve some exploring. Scientists predict that in the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to uncover a ton of these cities, and some might even be bigger than the ones we're talking about here. Michael Heckenberger, an anthropologist with the University of Florida, points out that we've seen some similar settlement features, like moats and causeways, in other parts of the ancient Amazon. This new research reveals something totally mind-blowing. Past examples of urbanism in the Amazon were more like groups of villages connected together, not quite what we'd call urban. You see, they were missing those fancy larger centers with their grand architecture and stuff. But guess what? Llanos de Mojos has got them. This place is the real deal when it comes to a fully urbanized Amazonian landscape. So, in the Llanos de Mojos region, a bunch of ancient settlements have been found. These were home to the Kasarabi people, who were all about hunting, fishing, and farming maize. We're talking about hundreds of sites spread across 1,700 square miles. But these sites were so remote and hidden in the tropical forest that it was like trying to find a proverbial needle in a haystack. A team of archaeologists weren't going to let that stop them, though. They decided to take to the skies and use some fancy LiDAR mapping technology. Just imagine an aircraft flying over the area, shooting out a bunch of infrared beams. These beams hit the ground and bounce back, giving us the distance to different objects. It's like creating a super detailed map from above. Using computer software, these genius scientists were able to strip away the trees from the images revealing the Earth's surface and all the ancient archaeological goodies hidden beneath. And boy, did they strike gold! They found a whopping 26 unique sites, including 11 that nobody even knew existed before. 
So what about these 26 super cool sites? Among them, we've got Landavar and Kotoka, which are like these huge urban centers. And get this, we already knew they existed, but the new maps revealed they cover one and a half and one half square miles respectively. These centers are surrounded by moat and rampart fortifications, like something out of a medieval castle. And they've got all sorts of crazy stuff inside. We're talking artificial terraces, massive earthen platform buildings, and pyramids that reach over 70 feet tall. All these epic buildings are actually facing the north-northwest. It's like they were trying to align themselves with the cosmos or something. This kind of cosmic worldview can be found in other ancient sites in the Amazon too. Now, let's take a bird's eye view and strip away all those pesky trees. We can see these two centers in all their glory, and they're actually connected to a whole network of settlements through a bunch of causeways. Picture it like spokes on a wheel, stretching out for miles. Canals also stretch out from these main centers and connect to rivers and Laguna San Jose. It's like they had their own water delivery system going on. These ancient guys totally reshaped the whole landscape with their crazy cosmology. The only bummer is that their impressive architecture was made from mud brick. While it looked amazing back then, it just wasn't as durable as the limestone used by the Maya. What happened to the Kasarabi and their settlements is still a big mystery. But based on dating at the sites, it looked like they disappeared around 1400 CE, way before Europeans arrived in the Amazon. One theory is that a massive drought hit the region and messed everything up. The researchers found these massive water reservoirs at various sites, which is pretty interesting, considering how rainy the Amazon is known to be. Who knows if they were for drinking water or farming fish and turtles? But hey, severe droughts have happened in the past, and it only takes a couple of bad harvests to make people pack up and move on. What's even more interesting is that these communities thrived in the same area where this guy Fawcett we mentioned before went missing while searching for his lost city of Z. Maybe he was onto something after all. This is how it was. Fawcett stumbled upon this super cool document called Manuscript 512 at the National Library of Brazil. It's believed to have been written by a Portuguese explorer. Now, according to this document, back in 1753, a group of explorers discovered the remains of an ancient city. It had arches, a statue, and even a temple with hieroglyphs. But the document didn't spill the beans on where this city was located. So Fawcett got all hyped up about finding this city and made it his secondary mission after his main goal of finding something called Z. At one point, he had to come back to Britain to run some errands, but in 1920, he decided to give it another shot. Fawcett went on a personal expedition to find the city, but it was unsuccessful. Five years later, Fawcett, his son Jack, and their buddy Raleigh Rimmel disappeared in the Mato Grosso jungle. Some researchers think that Fawcett might have been influenced by info he got from indigenous folks about this place called Kuhikagu. Turns out, Kuhikagu was discovered by Westerners in 1925, and it had the ruins of 20 towns and villages. Up to 50,000 people might have lived here. And get this, the discovery of other earthworks in southern Amazonia totally supports Fawcett's theory. In 2005, an American journalist wrote an article about Fawcett's crazy expeditions and discoveries. He called it the Lost City of Z. Catchy, right? Well, in 2009, he turned that article into a book with the same name. And in 2016, the super-talented writer-director James Gray made it into a movie. Now, here's where things get a bit sad. The Amazon region is changing rapidly. Farming, ranching, and energy production are changing this incredible place. And guess what? Those untouched areas with ancient relics won't stay untouched for long. It's a race against time to document and preserve what's left of our past before it's lost forever. Sing with me. Under the sea, darling, it's better. On where it's drier, take it from me. Okay, okay, I know these are not the correct lyrics to this famous Disney song, but hear me out. The deep sea is not all about singing mermaids and dancing crabs. It's actually filled with monster-like creatures that'll give you nightmares. So, if you're ready to meet them, grab your scuba gear and let's dive into the deep, mysterious waters to discover their fascinating and scary world. 
With its menacing appearance, one could call this fishy the vampire of the sea. While named for their disproportionately large, razor-sharp fangs protruding from their mouth, fang-tooths are actually quite small and harmless to humans. These choppers are actually more for catching prey than causing trouble, so there's no need to panic if you see one. And you'll be even more relieved to know that it's kind of unlikely for you to come across a fang-tooth, since they are among the deepest living fish. A regular day in the life of a fang-tooth looks like this. By day, they prefer to remain in the gloomy depths. Me too, fishies, me too. It's only towards the evening that they migrate toward the surface to have a feast under starlight. Ah, how romantic! And by daybreak, they return to the deep. What a chill schedule, am I right? So, as you can tell from their daily routine, fangtooths are among the more active deep-sea fishes. And by that I mean they seek out their food rather than just sitting and waiting. And thanks to their oversized teeth and mouth, hey, I can relate, they're able to attack prey that are even larger than themselves, which is very important in the very large, food-poor deep sea. Fitting to their environment, common fangtooths are dark-colored, either solid brown or black. And unlike most deep-sea fishes, they do not have light-producing organs or cells to communicate with each other or to attract their prey. Instead, they rely heavily on their sense of smell, in addition to making use of even the slightest bit of sunlight that makes it down to the depths. This light doesn't help them to see in any way, but it may be enough for potential prey to cast a shadow as they pass overhead, which lets fangtooths know they're around. Now here's one hilarious fun fact before we move on to the next creature. Fangtooths can never close their mouths because of their huge mouths and long teeth. But you know what? I would bet maybe 500 bucks that my orthodontist would claim he could fix that too. Our next horrific deep-sea animal is as real as a kraken can get. Giant squid, which actually did inspire the legends of the kraken, live up to their name. The largest one ever recorded by scientists was almost 59 feet long. It also probably weighed nearly a ton. You would think such a massive animal wouldn't be hard to miss. But since giant squid live deep underwater, they are difficult to come by. Giant squid, along with their cousin, the colossal squid, yep, they are different, have the largest eyes in the animal kingdom. They're somewhere around 10 inches in diameter. In other words, they are around the size of dinner plates. Peekaboo! Having such large eyes allows them to detect objects in the lightless depths of the ocean, where most other animals would see nothing. Not a zippo. Giant squids have eight arms and two long feeding tentacles that help them seize their prey. These tentacles are tipped with hundreds of powerful sharp teeth and are often double the length of their body. This helps them to snatch prey up to 33 feet away. Hey there, come a little closer. Most of what we know about giant squids come from those that floated to the surface and were found by fishermen. After years of research, it was only in 2012 that a group of scientists were able to successfully film a giant squid in its natural habitat for the first time. Yet again, the giant squid continues to remain largely a mystery due to their inhospitable deep-sea habitat. And maybe they're shy. Speaking of squids, this species is basically the space creature of the ocean. So, it's only been about 20 years since the big fin squid family was officially described by scientists. And there are still plenty of facts about them that are yet to be discovered. However, the big fin squid sightings as deep as 20,000 feet below the surface suggest that they can live deeper than any other known squid. You know what, let's scratch the word space creature and call them the disco dancers of the deep sea to make things a little less scary. Because of their long slender arms, adorned with extravagant rib-like fins, kind of make them look like they're ready to hit the dance floor. Anyway, these boogie arms and tentacles are estimated to max out at just under 30 feet. Aside from the estimations though, the largest known big fin squid was actually 21 feet long, with 20 feet of that being its arms and tentacles. How exactly a big fin squid uses them is still unknown. But scientists think they like to use them to trap prey that bump into them as they hang down in the water below their body or drag along the seafloor. There are only around a dozen confirmed big fin squid sightings worldwide, so you can just relax. 
because the chances of you getting hugged by a big fin squid are close to impossible. But I can't guarantee anything regarding your nightmares. <laughs> now, these are not one of your regular Jaws sharks. Let's start with the most strange fact about a frilled shark. It's considered a living fossil because of its primitive anatomic traits. That actually makes more sense once you learn that this species has been around for 80-some million years. So I have both good news and bad news. Frilled sharks live in the open ocean and spend much of their time in deep, dark waters far below the surface. However, they do feed at the surface of the ocean at night. When hunting food, they move like an eel, bending and lunging to capture their prey. And they can actually swallow it as whole, even if it is larger than their own size. This is all thanks to their long and flexible jaws, which are equipped with 300 recurved needle-like teeth. Okay, I am somewhat freaked out now. Unlike the rest of the deep-sea creatures I've talked about, frilled sharks might sometimes accidentally get caught in nets. So if fishing is your thing, <laughs> beware. This telescope won't help you see the stars and the planets. With its protruding eyes and elongated body, this little swimmer looks like it's wearing a pair of underwater binoculars, hence the name the telescope fish. Found in cold, deep, tropical to subtropical waters worldwide, they're known to be the species that undergoes one of the most drastic transformations in fishes. When the first larva was described in 1954, it was believed to be a new species rather than the larva of a telescope fish that were known to science since 1901. Despite the fact that they are only around 6 to 8 inches long, they're able to latch onto snacks that are bigger than their own size. That is thanks to their massive and highly stretching jaws, making up most of the size of their head. These large prey are then folded in half to fit in their expandable stomach. In 1925, scientists found a 5.5 inch long fish inside the stomach of a 3 inch long telescope fish, which they described as neatly folded. Despite all this, their cylindrical tube-shaped eyes are still the most fascinating and bizarre features of telescope fishes. Their specific shape increases light collection to help them detect their prey's weak bioluminescence even from a distance. But although their eyes are good for seeing things in the twilight, they're especially great at seeing silhouettes from below. That's why they orient themselves vertically in the water. Now I have to admit, they look kind of cute if you ask me. Sort of like uglier versions of minions. Yeah, right? For years, scientists have been struggling to explain bizarre sounds. Some repeating, some heard only once, that come from the dark depths of the ocean. From bewildering hums to worrying bloops, the water transmits outlandish acoustic phenomena. One of these mysterious noises got named the upsweep. For the first time, this long train of sounds was registered in 1991 in the Pacific Ocean. One of the most unusual things about this signal is that it keeps changing, as if trying to confuse researchers even more. Like some unearthly howl, it varies from high to low frequencies and then back again. And you can hear it better in the spring and fall than in the winter and summer. Why the upsweep? It's simple. The sound travels from the bottom of the ocean towards its surface, as if sweeping up. Scientists do have a theory explaining this phenomenon. The activity of undersea volcanoes. Hot lava pouring into ice-cold ocean water could theoretically create such noises, but there's no proof found yet. Plus, the sound has been declining since 1991, even though it can still be detected. The bloop is the name given to an ultra-low frequency and incredibly powerful underwater sound that was recorded in 1997 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The bloop continued for approximately one minute. Having started from a low rumble, it gradually rose in frequency. It also kind of mimicked the noise created by marine animals, but its volume was so great that no living creature known to science could have made it. When the bloop occurred, underwater microphones managed to record it from a distance of 3,000 miles away. Rumor has it that the noise might have something to do with the fictional half-octopus monster Cthulhu or some other colossal deep-water creature. But if you don't believe in monsters, 
science has another explanation. Iceberg fracturing. The thing is that ice quakes recorded in the Scotia Sea resemble the mysterious bloop a bit too much for it to be a coincidence. The whistle resembles this annoying sound when a kettle of boiling water is telling you it's time to make a cup of tea. But even though it may not be as blood-curdling as some other bizarre ocean sounds, it doesn't make it any less mysterious. Plus, the whistle is very elusive. In 1997, only one underwater microphone was able to pick it up, and therefore, researchers didn't manage to pinpoint the source of the noise. The most likely cause of the sound is an eruption of one of the submarine volcanoes. Have you ever heard of Julia? No, not your neighbor. I'm talking about this otherworldly sound. Listen to it. It was recorded in 1999 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The source of the sound was most likely a large iceberg that ran aground somewhere in Antarctica. The sound was so loud that it was heard over a huge territory, and its duration was about 2 minutes and 43 seconds. Slow down. That's the name given to a sound recorded in 1997 in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. The sound was called this way because it slowly decreased in frequency over seven minutes or so. It's been picked out a few more times since it was recorded for the first time. The source of the sound isn't very mysterious. Most likely, it was produced by a massive iceberg that became grounded in Antarctica, or it was caused by moving ice. By that, I mean the friction produced by a large ice sheet moving over land. The loneliest whale sound is often called the 52 hertz whale because the animal that creates it calls it at a unique for these creatures frequency. When you listen to this sound, it sounds like a low bass note. At the same time, it's much higher than the normal frequency of the whale call, which rings between 10 and 40 hertz. Interestingly, scientists have been listening to the world's loneliest whale for decades, but haven't managed to figure out its precise location. Nobody knows whether the mammal is male or female, what species it is, or if the animal is still alive. After all, for the last time, its call was recorded in 2004. Earth-shaking booming sounds have been reverberating off some parts of North Carolina for more than 150 years. Called Seneca guns, they're most often heard near the coast. The sounds are so powerful that they often rattle window panes and sometimes vibrate entire buildings. They can last from 1 to almost 10 seconds. Even though scientists haven't cracked this mystery yet, there are some theories. They range from earthquakes to severe distant storms and quarry blasts. But even though the ground trembles every time the phenomenon occurs, no seismic activity coincides with these events. So far, scientists have come to the conclusion that the mysterious sounds happen in the atmosphere, not on or under the surface of our planet. If this theory is true, bolides might be the answer. These extremely bright meteors often explode once they enter Earth's atmosphere. Or, Seneca guns might be born in the ocean. Sometimes, when enormous waves collide far away from the shore, you can hear it, even if you're nowhere near the coast. Seneca guns are a type of skyquakes. You don't need to travel to a particular part of the world to hear one of those. Mysterious sonic booms ramble from the sky everywhere, from the US to India and Japan. Just like Seneca guns, this sound phenomenon occurs mostly near the coast or a big body of water. Rattling glassware and windows in the nearby houses, skyquakes could be connected with ultra-fast airplanes breaking the sound barrier. But people started hearing the first skyquakes in 1824. The theories trying to explain this phenomenon include sand dunes shifting, meteors entering the atmosphere, distant volcanoes erupting, Earth's crust cracking during earthquakes, and even gas bursting out of underground vents in the sea or lake bottom. In 
In different countries all over the world, people get paralyzed with fear after hearing otherworldly trumpet sounds that seem to be coming from the sky. The inhabitants of the U.S., Canada, Australia, Germany, and the Philippines have already heard this hair-raising noise since it was first recorded in 2008. These sounds are sometimes called the sound of apocalypse. And although until recently, nobody could understand the origin of the sounds, NASA claims that there is nothing to be afraid of. The noise can be coming from our own planet. Usually, it's quiet and thus inaudible to the human ear. But when it gets louder, the outcome is the very trumpet sounds that scare people all over the world. Bristol Hum started in the 1970s when hundreds of Bristol inhabitants began to talk about a bizarre noise audible only at night. The noise was a low-level hum and nobody could identify or trace the source of the sound. But the strangest thing about the noise was that one day, it stopped as abruptly as it started. But not before people in other towns across Britain reported hearing similar sounds. Some time ago, the mysterious sound returned. In 2015, a group of French scientists claimed that they had solved the mystery of the Bristol Hum. They stated that the culprit was ocean waves that made the ocean floor vibrate. But while it was all good and well, it didn't explain why the sound was around for only several years or why it chose to return. If you ever come to the town of Taos in New Mexico, don't let another strange and unexplained phenomenon send you running for the hills. This phenomenon is a faint, low-frequency hum ringing in the desert air and grating on your nerves. Even stranger, only 2% of people who live in Taos hear this noise. But for those who do, it's unstoppable torture. On top of that, everyone describes the sound in a different way, from a quiet whir to an eerie hum or even persistent buzz. And while some people believe that the Taos hum is the result of unusual acoustics, the others suspect a bad case of mass hysteria. No one has located the origin of the hum yet. We've heard stories about people surviving in the desert, Amazon forest, and uninhabited islands for weeks. Such stories show how tough and resilient people can be. But among these many cases, there is one that can really amaze you. It's the story about a guy who spent three days inside a sunken ship at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. He didn't have oxygen tanks, electricity, communications, or food, but he survived. So it all happened in 2013 on a tugboat that was moving through the Atlantic waters along the coast of Nigeria. That day, early in the morning, there was a small storm. The tug was pulling a vessel with oil tanks. Then, all of a sudden, a huge wave formed. It crashed into the ship and broke the cable. At 4.30 a.m., the tugboat turned upside down. Its entire deck was underwater, and the ship's hull stuck out from the surface. The boat began to sink slowly. The crew of 12 people were trapped, as they all were in their locked rooms. They had closed the doors in their cabins as a precaution, since there were many pirates in those waters. Because of the locked rooms, they couldn't get out. But one of them, Cook Harrison Okina, was in the bathroom during this time. The bathroom turned over. Harrison fell on the ceiling. All the clothes and toilet shelves fell on his head. He was stunned and didn't understand what was happening. When he heard the screams of the other crew members, he realized that the ship was sinking. Harrison struggled to his feet. Holding onto the walls, he slowly went out of the cabin. The water level rose above his head. Harrison took a deep breath. He intuitively, driven by fear, reached the engineering room. There was a small pocket with air. This space wasn't wholly flooded, since the water didn't get there and the air hadn't come out. Harrison realized that this was the safest place for him at that moment. He had no fresh water and no food. He was in a cold, damp room. The floor was flooded and Harrison's feet began to freeze. There was almost no chance of survival. The man found a soda bottle inside the room and a life jacket with two flashlights attached to it. By this time, the ship had descended to the bottom of the ocean at a depth of 100 feet. This is about the height of a 10-story building. The ship's hull was squeezed and made a grinding noise due to the pressure of the water. Then, Harrison heard a strange movement outside the door. 
It was sharks and other fish that were investigating the deck. At this point, Harrison began to lose hope. Lack of food supplies and pressure weren't the main problems. The air pocket was small, which meant there was little oxygen. Every 24 hours, an average person consumes about 350 cubic feet of air, which means Harrison had less than one day left to breathe. But despite this, he lived in such conditions for about 60 hours. This happened thanks to the water. The pressure around the ship was so intense that it compressed the air by about four times. Another problem was the cook's breathing. When we inhale, we absorb oxygen. When we exhale, we release carbon dioxide. This substance is dangerous to your health if its concentration in the air is 5%. Harrison slowly filled the room with carbon dioxide, and he couldn't get out. With each hour, it became harder to breathe. But here again, he was lucky. Water absorbs carbon dioxide, and Harrison moved and splashed it in different directions. Thus, unknowingly, he increased the water area and kept the carbon dioxide level below critical. But even here, his dangers were not over. Hypothermia may occur in a dark, cold room. It's a condition when your body temperature drops below 95 degrees Fahrenheit. You get cold, and your perception of the world gets distorted. You don't understand where you are and what's going on. You may lose your memory and even experience terminal burrowing. This weird behavior occurs during hypothermia when a person tries to find a small shelter, even if they're in a closed room. They can even start digging the cold floor with their bare hands. At the same time, a person quickly freezes and loses consciousness within two hours. Harrison's room was filled from below with icy water. He wouldn't have survived in such conditions if he had stayed on the floor for several hours. But he managed to build a small platform with a mattress. This kept him slightly above the water level. With each passing hour, fear and despair more and more bound the survivor's mind. He couldn't get out for many reasons. One of them was that only a little sunlight passes to such a depth, and Harrison couldn't see it. The soda bottle was almost empty, and the flashlight stopped working. The man found himself in pitch darkness, but his salvation was close. While rescuers were searching for survivors nearby, he was thinking about his family and life. Harrison noticed rays of light through a hole in the wreckage. Divers were examining the seabed. It was the only chance to survive. Harrison came out of the air pocket and swam towards the rescuers. He was making his way through the darkness. The ray of light coming from the diver's flashlight disappeared. Harrison tried blindly to find the diver, but they were at the other end of the deck. His oxygen was running out, so Harrison decided to return. There was almost no air left in his lungs. He began to suffocate, but still got to the rescue room. The main thing was not to despair. It was his only chance for salvation. After catching his breath and replenishing the oxygen supply in his lungs, Harrison made a second attempt. He got out of the room and noticed the diver. He swam towards them with all of his might. The lifeguard didn't see Harrison, so the cook knocked on his neck from behind and grabbed his hand tightly. The diver was initially scared, but he realized a living person was in front of him. Harrison swam to his room and led the lifeguard as his oxygen ran out. You can easily find a recording from the diver's camera on the internet, where the frightened Harrison was in his rescue room during a meeting with the diver. The rescuers gave him an oxygen mask. They didn't believe there was a living person in front of them. Harrison couldn't immediately get to the surface because of the pressure. He spent about 60 hours on the seabed, so he needed to change the pressure level slowly to prevent damage to his health. Therefore, the divers put him in a decompression chamber to gradually reduce the external pressure. Then, when Harrison got out, he saw the stars. The cook thought that he had been at the bottom of the ocean all day. So he was surprised when he found out that he had been underwater for 60 hours. Also, he thought that all the crew members had forgotten about him and left the ship at the beginning. Many years have passed since then, but Harrison still has nightmares about his air room. Sometimes he wakes up in the middle of the night and tells his wife that the bed is sinking and they're now at sea. A similar case occurred in 1991 with scuba diver Michael Proudfoot. 
He was studying a sunken submarine off the coast of Baja, California. During this dive, he accidentally broke his breathing regulator and deprived himself of oxygen reserves. Michael couldn't get to the surface because he was too deep. He wouldn't have had enough air in his lungs. Fortunately, the diver found an air pocket inside the ship. He swam there and waited for rescuers. For two days, he was underwater in complete darkness. He ate raw sea urchins and drank a small amount of warm water from a found pot. Fortunately, rescuers found him. Michael Proudfoot got out of the trap and stayed alive. Ever wonder why, despite all our advancements in technology and science, there's a vast expanse of our own planet that we barely know about? Believe it or not, over 80% of our oceans remain uncharted territory. It's as if we've got this massive aquatic playground in our backyard and we've barely scratched the surface. Also, did you know that only about 7% of our oceans have a special tag called Marine Protected Areas, or MPAs? How come this colossal body of water that envelops most of our planet is also among the most vulnerable and misunderstood spaces in the universe? Pressure has a lot to do with it. Our deep ocean is a beast of a place with no visibility, freezing temperatures, and pressure that's so intense that in certain areas it would make you feel like you're having the weight of 50 jumbo jets on your body. No wonder we're having an easier time sending people into space than to the bottom of the ocean. The deeper you go into the waters, the more pressure piles up. But let's not forget we have tech on our side, right? Scientists now use these cool satellite technologies that track the color of the ocean to check how much phytoplankton is there, for example. Why is this important, you might ask? Because these little plant-like critters are actually pretty major players in our big blue oceans. In the grand scheme of things, in the aquatic world, phytoplankton is like the bedrock of the ocean food chain. It gives life to almost everything, from the tiny zooplankton, which are animal-like microorganisms, to those colossal, magnificent whales. When these technologies first came around, satellites could get clear images of the ocean faster than a ship could take the same number of measurements in 10 years. But it's not all about looking at the ocean from space. Sometimes you gotta dive in there and see it for yourself. Thankfully, we've come a long way in ocean exploration tech, too. We've got things like floats and drifters that ride the ocean currents while collecting data, and a whole fleet of underwater vehicles, some of which are manned, some remote-controlled, and some even autonomous. Remember James Cameron, the guy who made the movie Titanic? He's super into exploring the ocean, and in 2012, he set a record by going down to the Mariana Trench in a vertical torpedo sub. He thinks there's nothing like being in the ocean and experiencing it firsthand. Other companies use a mix of technologies for their ocean explorations. It led them to discover amazing stuff like a deep sea coral reef near Morocco, the only one still growing in the Mediterranean Sea. They've also discovered new species and documented ones previously thought to live only in the Atlantic. These efforts have convinced the local authorities to declare some places as marine parks. As with most scientific areas, the road isn't without its bumps. These expeditions can cost quite a lot, and the lack of detailed maps and data only adds to the challenge. We can't always rely on bathymetric information meaning the study of the ocean floor, because it's often not available. And that's the tricky part. We need to explore more to know more, but getting the funds for these kinds of projects can be tough when there are so many unknown variables. One particular company's explorations have helped protect nearly 4 million square miles of ocean so far. The data they collect during their expeditions is invaluable. It's used to identify new species, locate vulnerable habitats, and even show where threatened species are being overlooked. Their work helps dismiss excuses from local authorities who claim they lack the necessary information to establish more MPAs. The same company supports a goal known as 30 by 30, aiming to protect 30% of our oceans by 2030. It's a big target and there's a long road ahead, but ongoing ocean exploration can provide the proof needed to keep more of our oceans safe. We also need to set aside areas for protection and research, 
even when we don't have all the facts just yet. On that note, some cool scientists have recently stumbled upon a gigantic and mysterious world beneath the Pacific Northwest Coast's ocean floor. The best part is, this massive realm of life is pretty much cut off from the rest of the world above, making it like a secret underground club that only the best microbiologists have access to. Picture an active city, except the city is microscopic cracks in the basalt rocks of our oceanic crust and its residents are microbes. These tiny creatures aren't like you and me. They don't rely on sunlight or the organic products of land and water ecosystems for sustenance. Instead, they thrive on chemical reactions with rocks and seawater. Scientists call this type of life chemosynthetic, which sounds complicated, but it basically means life sustained by chemical reactions. While this sort of life has been found deep in mines and around seafloor hydrothermal vents, the scale at which these creatures are found under the oceanic crust is unprecedented. It might even be the most extensive ecosystem on Earth. A geomicrobiologist from Denmark was part of the team that made this discovery. He claimed that over 50% of our planet's surface is oceanic crust, which is an average of 4 miles thick. Imagine the size of this chemosynthetic party happening down there. This discovery didn't happen overnight. Since the 90s, scientists have found weird tiny holes in the basalt rocks that make up much of Earth's outer crust. They seem like they might have been made by bacteria. But hey, there was supposed to be no life there. I mean, imagine trying to survive in a place that's hot, deep, dark, dense, and mostly devoid of the organic compounds we need for life. Yet, here they are. In the following years, more pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Scientists found that the oceanic crusts had different conditions at the centers and edges. At the centers, rocks are jam-packed with energy-rich compounds that support these tiny life forms. But by the time they reach the edges, these chemicals are all gone. Fast forward to now, and it's time to put the puzzle together. A microbial ecologist from the University of North Carolina worked on this research and says we now have solid evidence of microbial life in the cracks and crevices of deep ocean basalt. The next question scientists asked was, how far does this life extend? Researchers collected samples of crust from a plate roughly 120 miles off of Washington's coast, drilling deep beneath the ocean's surface. What they found down there was remarkable. The life down there runs on a unique fuel, hydrogen. Yep, in the absence of sunlight, hydrogen provides the energy for all their biological processes. These microbes use hydrogen to transform carbon dioxide into organic matter. This matter and other byproducts, like methane, then fuel other organisms, creating a network of life. Of course, the life down there isn't as complex as the one we know up here. Scientists doubt there will be any multicellular life under the ocean because it's too hot and energy poor. But hey, who knows? This universe under our oceans still has a lot to reveal. This whole thing is significant for many reasons. First, it confirms that life can exist in places without oxygen, which changes our perspective on where we can find life. This makes us wonder if life could exist under similar conditions on other planets where surface conditions might be too harsh. The implications on Earth are also profound. If a large portion of life exists in the oceanic crust, then our understanding of life on our own planet could be completely changed. This exciting discovery stretches our understanding of life and prompts us to keep exploring the mysterious depths of our oceans, pushing the limits of our understanding. NASA is also in on the whole deep-sea exploration project. Why? Shouldn't they be preoccupied with outer space? Because they're hoping to find hints about what the oceans on other planets might look like. NASA specialists are really hopeful that by unearthing underwater secrets, we can solve some of the big questions about space. Plus, they're testing some nifty equipment for future journeys across our solar system. For years, scientists have been struggling to explain bizarre sounds, some repeating, some heard only once, that come from the dark depths of the ocean. From bewildering hums to worrying bloops, 
the water transmits outlandish acoustic phenomena. One of these mysterious noises got named the upsweep. For the first time, this long train of sounds was registered in 1991 in the Pacific Ocean. One of the most unusual things about this signal is that it keeps changing, as if trying to confuse researchers even more. Like some unearthly howl, it varies from high to low frequencies and then back again, and you can hear it better in the spring and fall than in the winter and summer. Why the upsweep? It's simple. The sound travels from the bottom of the ocean towards its surface, as if sweeping up. Scientists do have a theory explaining this phenomenon. The activity of undersea volcanoes. Hot lava pouring into ice-cold ocean water could theoretically create such noises, but there's no proof found yet. Plus, the sound has been declining since 1991, even though it can still be detected. The bloop is the name given to an ultra-low frequency and incredibly powerful underwater sound that was recorded in 1997 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The bloop continued for approximately one minute. Having started from a low rumble, it gradually rose in frequency. It also kind of mimicked the noise created by marine animals, but its volume was so great that no living creature known to science could have made it. When the bloop occurred, underwater microphones managed to record it from a distance of 3,000 miles away. Rumor has it that the noise might have something to do with the fictional half-octopus monster Cthulhu or some other colossal deep-water creature. But if you don't believe in monsters, science has another explanation. Iceberg fracturing. The thing is that ice quakes recorded in the Scotia Sea resemble the mysterious bloop a bit too much for it to be a coincidence. The whistle resembles this annoying sound when a kettle of boiling water is telling you it's time to make a cup of tea. But even though it may not be as blood-curdling as some other bizarre ocean sounds, it doesn't make it any less mysterious. Plus, the whistle is very elusive. In 1997, only one underwater microphone was able to pick it up, and therefore, researchers didn't manage to pinpoint the source of the noise. The most likely cause of the sound is an eruption of one of the submarine volcanoes. Have you ever heard of Julia? No, not your neighbor. I'm talking about this otherworldly sound. Listen to it. It was recorded in 1999 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The source of the sound was most likely a large iceberg that ran aground somewhere in Antarctica. The sound was so loud that it was heard over a huge territory, and its duration was about 2 minutes and 43 seconds. Slow down. That's the name given to a sound recorded in 1997 in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. The sound was called this way because it slowly decreased in frequency over seven minutes or so. It's been picked out a few more times since it was recorded for the first time. The source of the sound isn't very mysterious. Most likely, it was produced by a massive iceberg that became grounded in Antarctica, or it was caused by moving ice. By that, I mean the friction produced by a large ice sheet moving over land. The loneliest whale sound is often called the 52 hertz whale because the animal that creates it calls at a unique for these creatures frequency. When you listen to this sound, it sounds like a low bass note. At the same time, it's much higher than the normal frequency of the whale call, which rings between 10 and 40 hertz. Interestingly, scientists have been listening to the world's loneliest whale for decades but haven't managed to figure out its precise location. Nobody knows whether the mammal is male or female, what species it is, or if the animal is still alive. After all, for the last time, its call was recorded in 2004. Earth-shaking booming sounds have been reverberating off some parts of North Carolina for more than 150 years. Called Seneca guns, they're most often heard near the coast. 
the sounds are so powerful that they often rattle window panes and sometimes vibrate entire buildings. They can last from one to almost 10 seconds. Even though scientists haven't cracked this mystery yet, there are some theories. They range from earthquakes to severe distant storms and quarry blasts. But even though the ground trembles every time the phenomenon occurs, no seismic activity coincides with these events. So far, scientists have come to the conclusion that the mysterious sounds happen in the atmosphere, not on or under the surface of our planet. If this theory is true, bolides might be the answer. These extremely bright meteors often explode once they enter Earth's atmosphere. Or Seneca guns might be born in the ocean. Sometimes, when enormous waves collide far away from the shore, you can hear it, even if you're nowhere near the coast. Seneca guns are a type of skyquakes. You don't need to travel to a particular part of the world to hear one of those. Mysterious sonic booms ramble from the sky everywhere, from the US to India and Japan. Just like Seneca guns, this sound phenomenon occurs mostly near the coast or a big body of water. Rattling glassware and windows in the nearby houses, skyquakes could be connected with ultra-fast airplanes breaking the sound barrier. But people started hearing the first skyquakes in 1824. The theories trying to explain this phenomenon include sand dunes shifting, meteors entering the atmosphere, distant volcanoes erupting, Earth's crust cracking during earthquakes, and even gas bursting out of underground vents in the sea or lake bottom. In different countries all over the world, people get paralyzed with fear after hearing otherworldly trumpet sounds that seem to be coming from the sky. The inhabitants of the US, Canada, Australia, Germany, and the Philippines have already heard this hair-raising noise since it was first recorded in 2008. These sounds are sometimes called the sound of apocalypse. And although until recently, nobody could understand the origin of the sounds, NASA claims that there is nothing to be afraid of. The noise can be coming from our own planet. Usually, it's quiet and thus inaudible to the human ear. But when it gets louder, the outcome is the very trumpet sounds that scare people all over the world. Bristol Hum started in the 1970s when hundreds of Bristol inhabitants began to talk about a bizarre noise audible only at night. The noise was a low-level hum, and nobody could identify or trace the source of the sound. But the strangest thing about the noise was that one day, it stopped as abruptly as it started. But not before people in other towns across Britain reported hearing similar sounds. Some time ago, the mysterious sound returned. In 2015, a group of French scientists claimed that they had solved the mystery of the Bristol hum. They stated that the culprit was ocean waves that made the ocean floor vibrate. But while it was all good and well, it didn't explain why the sound was around for only several years or why it chose to return. If you ever come to the town of Taos in New Mexico, don't let another strange and unexplained phenomenon send you running for the hills. This phenomenon is a faint, low-frequency hum ringing in the desert air and grating on your nerves. Even stranger, only 2% of people who live in Taos hear this noise. But for those who do, it's unstoppable torture. On top of that, everyone describes the sound in a different way, from a quiet whir to an eerie hum or even persistent buzz. And while some people believe that the Taos hum is the result of unusual acoustics, the others suspect a bad case of mass hysteria. No one has located the origin of the hum yet. Hello, distinguished guests, and welcome to Aquarium Bright. Here, you will get to see the most dangerous sea and ocean creatures. But don't let what I said mislead you. It's very well possible for you to come across one of these underwater animals during a walk on the beach. So take a look at them carefully now, and you might just avoid a disaster. Is it fish or is it stone? What you're looking at is commonly known as the stonefish. But its fancier names include the Dornorn and the Sinansia. If you're into diving and observing the underwater, you might already have come across one without noticing. 
Its appearance makes it almost impossible to distinguish it from a real stone due to its gray coloration and mottled appearance, especially if you're wearing fogged snorkel goggles. So you better pay attention because otherwise, the consequences can be unfortunate since stonefish are the most venomous fish known. Although some types of stonefishes are known to live in rivers, and most of them are found in coral reefs near the tropical Pacific and Indian Oceans. Their needle-like dorsal fin spines stick up when they're disturbed or threatened and inject the poison they contain. The most common reason why stonefish stings occur is swimmers stepping on them without realizing it. However, you don't need to be in the water to get stung. Since they can survive out of the water for up to 24 hours, you'll have to watch where you step when you're at the beach as well. Those who got stung by stonefish describe their experience to be extremely distressing. Their venom can result in infection, and in some cases, it is known to cause shock and paralysis. It might come as a bit of a shock, but despite its bad reputation, stonefish is edible if it's prepared properly. When the fish is heated, its venom breaks down. And if the dorsal fins, which are the main source of its venom, are removed, raw stonefish is served as part of sashimi too. This creature might look like it came out of a science fiction movie, but it's very much real. Say hello to the blue-ringed octopuses. Don't be deceived by their small size, which can range between 5 to 8 inches, including their arms, because they're packed with venom to cause great damage to as many as 26 people within minutes. Just like stonefishes, blue-ringed octopuses are found in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, from Japan to Australia. They typically live on coral reefs and rocky areas of the seafloor. Some may also be found in tide pools, seagrass, and algal beds. Blue-ringed octopuses are not aggressive in nature. When they're not seeking food such as crabs or shrimps, or searching for a mate, they often hide in marine debris, shells, or crevices. It's only if they're provoked, cornered, or handled that they get dangerous to humans. When they're threatened, they turn bright yellow or blue iridescent rings appear all over their body as a warning display towards the potential predators. Their bites usually come unnoticed, so you might not be able to realize you're bitten until it's too late. The venom of a blue-ringed octopus can cause dizziness and loss of senses and motor skills, and ultimately, paralysis. So, better try to keep your hands to yourself and back away in a hurry if you see one. Nope, it's not a flower bouquet, so don't try to pick and smell one of those pink tube-like things. What's standing before your eyes is a marine animal called a flower urchin. It may look gorgeous, but don't let the looks deceive you. It was named the most dangerous sea urchin in the 2014 Guinness World Records. Flower urchins inhabit the tropical areas of the Indo-West Pacific and are found among coral reefs, rocks, sand, and seagrass beds at depths of 0 to 295 feet. The most noticeable feature of them is their pedicularia, which are claw-shaped defensive organs that are also found in sea stars. What makes flower urchins differ from any other sea urchin is the fact that their pedicularia is, as the name suggests, flower-like and usually pinkish-white to yellowish-white in color, with a central purple dot. Hidden underneath those flowers, they possess short and blunt spines. Although many sea urchins deliver their venom through such spines, flower urchins deliver their venom through their pedicularia, or flowers. If they're undisturbed, the tips of these flowers are usually expanded into round, cup-like shapes. On their surface, they possess tiny sensors with which they can detect threats. And once they contact such threats, these flowers immediately snap shut and start injecting venom. What's weird is that the little claws of the flowers can sometimes break off from their stalks, stick to the point of contact, and continue injecting venom for hours into whoever touched it. Yeesh! Looks like a giant puddle of melted strawberry ice cream, right? You wish! It's a lion's mane jellyfish, which is also called giant jellyfish, arctic red jellyfish, or hairy jelly. They're known to prefer cool water. That's why they can mostly be found in the Arctic, northern Atlantic, and northern Pacific Oceans. But it's possible to spot them around the British Isles or in the Scandinavian waters too. Lion's mane jellyfish are one of the largest known species of jellyfish. 
They get their name from their long, flowing hair-like tentacles and can reach lengths up to 10 feet. And although the average bell diameter of a lion's mane jellyfish is around 20 inches, they can sometimes attain a diameter of over 7 feet. The largest lion's mane jellyfish recorded was seen in 1865 off the coast of Massachusetts. It was measured to have tentacles around 125 feet long and a diameter of 7 feet. To help you picture it, this is longer than a blue whale. Lion's mane jellyfish hunt by extending their tentacles outward and creating a trap to catch their food. Since they have around 1,200 stinging tentacles, the fish would have to be extremely lucky to be able to escape them. The sting of a lion's mane jellyfish is usually not life-threatening, but you would still want to avoid swimming into its tentacles because it can be very painful to humans. And if you see one washed up on the beach, better not touch it because it can still deliver a sting long after they've been on the shore. Fun fact, the lion's mane jellyfish appears in the Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of the Lion's Mane, as a suspect. But don't worry, we won't give you any spoilers. The last marine animal you're seeing now is a sea snake, and yes, they are different from eels. There are 69 identified species of sea snakes. Most of them can be found in the tropical and subtropical waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans, and they have been around for millions of years. To make things easier, scientists have separated all different species of sea snakes into two categories, true sea snakes and sea crates. Whereas true sea snakes spend almost all their time at sea, sea crates can spend some time on land as well. If you see a snake on the beach, you can tell whether it's a land or sea snake by looking at its tail. If it's paddle-like, then that's a sea snake you got there, but make sure to keep your distance in both cases. All sea snakes need to surface regularly to breathe since they have no gills. That's why you can come across one while swimming. If that happens, you better swim away as fast as you can because most sea snakes have more venom than the average cobra or rattlesnake. However, since they only attack if provoked, bites are quite rare. One more cool fact about sea snakes, they are the only reptiles to give birth in the oceans. The majority of sea snakes keep the eggs within themselves and give birth to nearly fully formed snakes while swimming. That's except for the yellow-lipped sea crate though. They come onto land to lay eggs of their little ones. Remember the stonefish from the beginning of our tour? They're hunted by sea snakes. Blame the food chain. How would you describe the shape of the planet we live on? It's definitely round, but it's not a perfect sphere. Because of the force of Earth's rotation, it's slightly flat on the North and South Pole. But there's more to it. The planet's rotation causes its sides to bulge outwards. The best term to describe our home planet is ellipsoid. Earth is nothing more than an oversized lumpy potato. These are the words of Atraji Ghosh, a solid Earth geophysicist from Bangalore. She and her team have been studying something called the Indian Ocean Gravity Hole. Sounds like the scenario for a science fiction movie, but it's very much real. We think of gravity as something consistent. If you drop a pen from your hand in Los Angeles and in Perth, they're going to fall to the floor at the same time. Well, this is not completely true. Gravity is connected with the mass of a celestial body. Astronauts on the surface of our moon don't walk, but move in hops. That's because Earth weighs 81 times more than the moon. Less mass means less gravity. Earth is more massive, so it has a stronger gravitational pull. But there's a catch. All this mass isn't distributed evenly across the planet. As a result, gravity varies as well. NASA has been mapping Earth's gravity field since 2002 using twin GRACE satellites. The maps they produced show where gravity is stronger and where it's weaker. Mountain ranges such as the Himalayas contain a lot of mass. This means they generate a stronger gravity field. The opposite happens in ocean trenches. The deepest of them is the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean. You could almost stack two Mount Kilimanjaros inside it. The low concentration of Earth's mass below it means that the gravity field here is weaker. Places on the globe where huge chunks of mass are missing are called geoid lows. 
A geoid is an imaginary surface that follows the outline of sea levels around our planet. Imagine the Earth without any land. That shouldn't be too hard since the nickname of our home is Blue Planet. Now draw a curvy line along the surface of the oceans, and you get a geoid. In reality, the line stretches across oceans, as well as land masses. Scientists use this imaginary line to calculate the depth of tremors or objects that occur underground. When the wavy line goes down, that's a geoid low. The biggest of them sits at the bottom of the Indian Ocean. The first to discover it was a Dutch geophysicist in 1948. He was performing a gravity survey from a ship. The man noticed that sea levels dipped over 320 feet below the global average. The gravity hole got the official name Indian Ocean Geoid Low. It spans well over a million square miles off the southern coast of India. If you went out at sea in the middle of the gravity hole, you wouldn't notice much, just an endless ocean as far as the eye could see. The only way to measure the dip in gravity is through extensive geophysical measurements and calculations. The concept of a gravitational hole existed for nearly two centuries in the scientific community, but researchers could study it in high detail only after satellite measurements became possible in the late 20th century. A team of Indian scientists was determined to explain the anomaly that had been puzzling geologists for decades. They used supercomputers to simulate the seismic activity that formed our planet. A total of 19 simulations revealed how tectonic plates moved across the span of over 140 million years. This was during the Cretaceous period, the time when T-Rex roamed the Earth. Nearly a third of the possible scenarios produced a geoid low, similar to the one in the Indian Ocean. The most important factor in these models was the presence of magma plumes. These are places inside the Earth's mantle where lava flows upwards. The mantle sits between the planet's outer core and the thin crust we walk upon. The magma in the mantle plume is hotter than the surrounding rocks. The heat it generates melts and thins the crust. This creates hotspots that are brimming with volcanic activity. Yellowstone National Park and the Hawaiian Islands sit atop such hotspots. The Indian team of scientists linked the presence of magma plumes to the formation of the geoid low. Their source was an ancient ocean that disappeared tens of millions of years ago. It was located where the Himalayan mountain range sits today. Evidence of this lie in the marine rocks researchers found on the world's tallest mountains. The oceans ceased to exist when India's landmass separated from the supercontinent called Gondwana. It drifted north and merged with the rest of the Asian continent. At the time, the Eurasian supercontinent was called Laurasia. The Indian tectonic plate went down inside the mantle. It ended up under the African continent. This landmass contained a lot of crystallized material, which was quite dense. When the sinking plate of the former ocean reached it, plumes of magma spilled out. As a result, low-density materials ended up closer to Earth's surface. Density is used to calculate mass, and if you remember our lesson in physics from the beginning of the video, less mass translates into a weaker gravity field. Scientists believe this is how the geoid low in the Indian Ocean formed some 20 million years ago. At this point in prehistory, the Earth looked a lot like it does today. There were vast grasslands, and whales swam in the seas. Geophysicists who created the computer model cannot tell for sure what will happen in the future. Ghosh thinks it's possible that the gravity hole in the Indian Ocean will remain in place for a long time. But plate movements can also cause the anomaly to fully disappear in the coming eons. Earth's tectonic plates are constantly shifting. They define the shape of our continents and oceans. Experts study plate movements to get a picture of how our world looked millions of years ago. However, telling Earth's geologic future is much more complex. The gravity hole in the Indian Ocean is the biggest, but it's not the only one in the world. Other areas with low gravity include the island of Cuba and the Bahamas. On the opposite side of the spectrum are the Philippines. Here, gravity is stronger than normal, but the poles are the places with the strongest pull to them. They are the closest to the center of the Earth. If you stand directly on the North or the South Pole, 
you are 3,950 miles from the planet's core. At sea level on the equator, this distance increases by more than 13 miles. Earth's gravitational field also has an effect on your weight. At the equator, you weigh 1% less than you do on the poles. The South Pole is maybe more suitable for this experiment because there is actually ground there. But gravity is the strongest at the North Pole in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. This is where scientists in 2013 recorded the highest gravitational acceleration on the planet. This is the rate a falling object speeds up in freefall. The acceleration depends on the strength of gravity. When a team of researchers from a university in Perth set out to map these gravity changes, they discovered something interesting. Gravitational acceleration was the highest at the surface of the Arctic Ocean. This is something they expect to find, but the location of the lowest acceleration point amazed them. It wasn't on the equator as they assumed. The spot lay more than 600 miles south of it at Mount Huascaru in Peru. Scientists believe that the mountain's height had an effect on the phenomenon. This peak in the Andes is the highest point in the South American country. Hypothetically speaking, if a human falls from a height of 330 feet here, they will reach the ground 16 milliseconds later than if they performed the same stunt in the Arctic. Oh, gravity, you heartless so-and-so. Well, that's what I think when I trip over a stone and fall face down. Of course, I'm not clumsy, you know. Anyway, gravity is a constant, right? Something entirely unshakable that we can always rely on in this ever-changing world. Unlike, you know, love. Feeling romantic, sorry. But what if I told you that it's not as honest and clear as you think? There are places on our planet where gravity behaves like it's gone crazy. And that's why you clicked here. So let's take a look. Magnetic Hill in Leh, India. There's a stretch of road in India that's been attracting tourists from all over the world. It's no different looking from the surrounding landscape, and you could easily pass it by without noticing, if not for one very unusual and a bit creepy thing. If you stop your car on the magnetic hill going up the slope and put it on neutral, it'll start crawling upwards, eventually reaching the speed of up to 12 miles per hour. They say there's some sort of magnetic force at work here that tugs cars up the hill, hence the name. On top of that, even airplanes are said to gain altitude above this place. Skeptics offer another explanation, though. It's just the lay of the land that creates an illusion of going upwards, while in fact, you're moving down the hill and vice versa. Whatever the truth, I'd like to see it for myself. Would you? Tell me down in the comments. The Crooked Forest, Poland Near the village of Nova Charnovo, there's a forest in the depth of which you can find a strangely-looking pine tree. Planted in the 1930s, there are 400 trees that sharply twist to the north almost at the roots and then grow upwards in a semicircle. Although scientists offer different theories about the tree's weird growth, nobody can say for sure what made them look like that. Some say it's people who did it, while others believe it's a gravitational anomaly that somehow pushed the trees down. The trouble with this version, though, is that it would have had to stay there for years, and that only affected the trees. Still, no certain explanation exists anyways, so who knows? A waterfall, Faroe Islands. Ever seen an upward-moving waterfall? You can have a look at one on the Faroe Islands, halfway from Iceland to Scotland. But if you were expecting me to tell you an unbelievable story about a mysterious force pushing the water up the rock, then sorry, no such thing here. The truth, however, is quite jaw-dropping anyway. The winds in this place are so powerful that they lift the water and throw it back up. I guess it was this kind of wind that allowed Mary Poppins to travel on her umbrella. Sounds good. In fact, this waterfall is not unique. There are several more places on Earth where winds create an illusion of defied gravity. For example, there's the Kinder River in England that has a waterfall constantly struggling with the wind. It's so strong that half of the Cascades' water seems to just fly up without ever touching the bottom of the drop. Hoover Dam in Nevada, USA 
If you ever get up to the top of the dam, which is about 726 feet high, you can try a little trick. Take a bottle of water and pour it over the edge. You'll see the water flow up instead of spilling down. Once again, this isn't really any magic or unnatural phenomenon. The wind up here is simply too strong for the water to fall, just like with the waterfall on the Faroe Islands. Here, though, it looks even more impressive since you can do it yourself. Dokapi Road, South Korea Another gravitational anomaly located on a road. Locals once found out that if you put an empty can or a bottle on the ground, it will immediately start rolling uphill. Unlike other such places in the world, though, Dokabi Road doesn't just create an illusion. When you walk down the slope, you don't feel as if you're going up. Everything's pretty normal. But once you put down an object that can roll, it will do that in the opposite direction than it should. Local authorities were quick to get the idea and put a signpost directing curious tourists to the mysterious road. Golden Rock, Burma If you happen to be in Burma, these days it's also called Myanmar, make sure to visit this well-known site. A gold-leaf-covered boulder sits upon the edge of a cliff, and a small pagoda is built on top of it. The impressive thing about the rock is that it only lightly touches the cliff for support. In fact, it looks like the boulder will fall any minute now, but it has been standing like that for centuries. On top of that, the pagoda built upon it is not really a recent addition, so it's quite an unusual sight to see. The rock seems to be saying, gravity? Hmm, I don't care about that stuff. The legend has it that what keeps the boulder in place is a single strand of Buddha's hair. Well, I don't know about that, but you can check out the rock for yourself and see that it's not attached to the cliff by anything. And yet, it's not budged for 2,500 years. Something must be at work here, huh? Stone of Davasco, Argentina If there ever was a thing that said, I defy gravity out loud, it's the Stone of Davasco. The huge 300-ton boulder stands precariously on the edge of a cliff and rocks a little bit from side to side in the wind. People even checked it by putting glass bottles under one of its edges. They exploded with another movement of the rock. Unfortunately, today you can't see this wonder of nature as it was a century ago. In 1912, the boulder suddenly dropped from its perch, which it had occupied for literally hundreds of years. The people in the nearby town of Tandil were so sad about this event that 95 years later, in 2007, they decided to restore the stone. Well, not exactly put it together chip by chip, they made a plastic replica of the rock and put it on the same spot and even in the same position. So even today, coming by Tandil, you can see its famous balancing boulder. More of a symbol now, of course, because it's no longer rocking and only weighs 9 tons, but instantly recognizable nonetheless. Devil's Tower in Wyoming, USA Remember this place from the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind? If not, you should go watch it, but not right now. This place doesn't make you feel like you're witnessing some magic and doesn't really trick gravity right before your eyes. Sounds almost boring compared with the rest of the sites on my list, right? But the true mind-blowing feature of Devil's Tower is that scientists can't explain how it came to existence in the first place. You see, it's an 867-foot rock formation with walls so steep they're basically vertical. But that isn't even the main thing. This piece of stone just rose amid rolling plains of Wyoming with nothing like it for miles and miles around. So how is it that such a flat landscape could have suddenly given birth to something so tall? Theories abound, but nobody has the answer yet. My theory? Well, perhaps here is where the Earth has a giant Audi belly button. Well then, you come up with a better theory. Oregon Vortex, USA The House of Mystery in Gold Hill, Oregon amazes its visitors with gravity-defying effects. You can't stand straight there, always leaning to the side and having to hold on to something for balance. Balls roll upwards. And there's also a broom that stands perfectly still wherever you put it unlike virtually everything else in this shack. The local Native American tribes called this place the Forbidden Ground, even before the house was built there, and they avoided approaching it. 
The owners of the shack, though, decided to turn it into an attraction, and they succeeded. They created an atmosphere of mystery around the place and spread the news about it in newspapers and later on the internet. And voila, a perfect anomaly is made. In fact, it's no more than a curiosity, a human-made optical illusion that tricks your eyes and other senses. Hudson Bay, Canada Okay, we've talked about some pretty ambiguous stuff. But now it's time for the real deal, the Hudson Bay Anomaly. This is probably the only place in the world where gravity is indeed lower than anywhere else on the planet. Even skeptics can't smirk at it because the difference has been measured with precision equipment. So does it mean that the gravity here is as low as, say, on the moon then? Unfortunately, or is it luckily, I'm not sure yet, the difference is minuscule. The exact value is 0.005% or 1 200th of a percent. You won't be able to feel it even if you try your hardest, but it's still there. Scientists say this anomaly exists because of the ice sheet that covered the area about 10,000 years ago. It compressed the rocks so much that they still can't fully recover, shifting the gravitational field in Hudson Bay. Sometime in the future, though, the gravity will return to normal in this area as well. No moonwalk for me, then. You decide to go out for a morning jog for the first time in your life. You put on your headphones and get ready for something hard and unpleasant. But as soon as you go outside, you feel an extraordinary lightness. At first, you enjoy it and speed up, but then you realize that something's wrong. You're running too fast and too easily. You feel like you've just taken off a heavy backpack that you've been carrying all your life. You're so fast, you think you must have a superpower now. But you notice another athlete running as quickly as you. You notice a puddle ahead of you and jump over it. You jump so far and so high, it feels physically impossible. You fall to the ground, shocked. Then you notice there are no scratches on your body and the ground feels lighter. You stop the music in your headphones and turn on the radio. All the news reports say the gravity on the entire planet has decreased by half. Thanks to gravity, we stand on the ground and don't fly away into the sky. This power allows our planet to revolve around the sun and the moon to revolve around us. Heavy things seem heavy because of gravity. And now, something has happened to the Earth's core, and the mass of our planet has decreased. This is the reason for the change in gravity. People happily run out of their houses and jump twice as high and further than they used to. Any objects seem twice as light to you. Your body has become lighter, so you can easily stand on your hands. But still, you don't feel like a superhero. You can't lift a car even if its weight was reduced by half. But now, parkour is easier for everyone than before. Your body's weight has decreased, which means you get less damage when you fall. However, panic quickly replaces the joy of the new conditions. It becomes hard for you to breathe, the same as all other people. The air has become lighter. The updated force of gravity has reduced the air pressure by half. Now you feel like you're at an altitude of 16,500 feet among the streets of a usual town. It's like you're halfway to the top of Mount Everest. The air is no longer as dense, and the main part of it has settled in the atmosphere. In the beginning, everyone experiences massive dizziness and panic. You feel like there's not enough air in your lungs, so you get nervous. To solve this problem, you have to learn to breathe slowly and evenly. Thanks to this, you calm down a bit. Others also learn to be more balanced and don't live in a hurry anymore. All of you experience less stress and enjoy every day. Then scientists create unique oxygen masks. You put it on, take a breath, and a special filter puts pressure on the oxygen molecules, making the air denser. After a couple of decades, people will take off these masks as they'll ultimately get used to the new conditions new generations will be born with adapted lungs. The Earth's atmosphere is expanding. It seems the sky has risen higher and acquired a darkish hue. Satellites flying around the Earth's orbit are now inside our atmosphere, but the Earth's gravity still attracts them. You see thousands of satellites burning up. Some of the space debris survives the atmospheric shield and falls to the ground.
a meteor shower begins. Space trash crashes into houses, roads, trees, and cars. You and the rest of the people decide to wait out the storm underground, in the subway or basements. Fortunately, the shower doesn't last long. People come out of their hiding and look at the sky in surprise. The moon changes its previous position and slowly flies away. Soon, it disappears completely. Our planet is now like a heavy ball in the center of a huge blanket. That blanket is gravity. It bends under the ball's weight. If you put any light object on the blanket, it will roll down to Earth. But if an object is moving at high speed, it will be able to spin on the blanket's edge and not fall into the center. Thanks to such speed, the moon doesn't fall on us, but at the same time, it can't fly away. Now that gravity has decreased, the blanket has become twice as loose. The rotation speed allows the moon to fly out of our gravitational field. It just goes into space. People will be able to observe the wandering moon for a long time through telescopes. Meteorites might crash into it. It could also find another planet with stronger gravity and will revolve around this new home. The moon may stay in place, but will be revolving around the Earth at a slower speed. In any case, there will be no more tides on our planet and the sea level will remain the same. In the sea, you can also feel the changes. It's much easier for you to stay on the water and you can swim faster. But the coolest thing is running along the shore. The splashes are floating in different directions so slowly and beautifully. The waves are running on the sand in slow motion too. The weight of cars, planes, and ships has reduced, and so people consume less gas now. You can drive twice as far with a full tank. Fuel transportation is easier, and less energy is spent on flights. Gasoline is becoming cheaper. The decrease in gravity inspires space tourism development. It becomes much easier for people to fly out of the Earth's orbit. Winter has come. You're walking down the street during a snowfall. It seems to you the snowflakes are stuck in the air as they're so slow. You step on the ice and realize that it's almost impossible to walk on such a slippery surface. Your weight has decreased and the pressure of your feet on the ice is twice as weak. You're sliding and can't stop. You often fall, but you don't feel any harm. When the wind is strong, it's hard to stay on your feet. If you jump, you may even fly away. The grip of wheels on the road deteriorates. A driver can no longer brake abruptly. The wheels don't spin, but the car continues to slide for a while. That's why new speed limits are being introduced all over the world. You can still enjoy extraordinary strength and long jumps, but after a few generations, the human body will evolve and fully adapt to these conditions. People and animals will be born taller and bulkier. Majestic tigers the size of a truck are walking through the city streets. Flamingos the size of a plane are flying in the dark blue sky. But the worst thing is that the size of insects has increased too. A regular cockroach can now grow to be the size of a computer mouse, and tarantulas become twice the size of an adult palm. At the same time, all living beings become lighter in weight. Humans will become elegant and agile creatures. Our bones and muscles will stretch. The structure of the entire human body will change. We'll become thinner and smoother. Blood in the veins and vessels will flow more slowly, and it will greatly impair the brain's work, but only in the beginning. In the future, the body will expand. The brain will increase, as will the number of neural connections inside. The lungs will become more sensitive and spacious. People will be smarter and wiser. All devices and materials will be developed according to the new conditions. A cup, a pencil, a plate, phones, and other gadgets. Everything will get lighter and more fragile. If an ordinary person gets into such a world, they'll feel like a superhero. You'll be able to punch through lightweight walls and doors and break bricks with your hand. New people won't match your power, but you'll seem too small and clumsy to them. You might not think about gravity much, but it affects everything we do. It's the reason why things fall down instead of flying up. It keeps us connected to the Earth, so we don't float away into space when we jump. 
But for physicists, gravity is something more. It's a fascinating puzzle that needs to be solved to understand how the universe works, and they're on a quest to uncover its secrets. So what's so mysterious about it? Let's see. We've learned a lot about gravity from the legendary Isaac Newton. He was the first to invent the law of gravitation. He taught us that any two objects in the universe can't help but be attracted to each other. It's like they have this secret gravitational crush going on. How strong this attraction is depends on two things. How big the objects are, that is their mass, and how close they are to each other. But here's where it gets cool. Gravity isn't just a two-object dance. It's a complex space choreography. Take our solar system, for example. The sun plays the lead role, using its gravitational pull to keep all the planets in their orbits. But each planet also has its own gravitational mojo, tugging at the sun and even its neighboring planets. Then, a few hundred years later, another hero, Albert Einstein, took gravity to a whole new level. He described the theory of general relativity. According to Einstein, gravity isn't just a regular force. In reality, it's curving and warping the fabric of space-time. Think of it as a heavyweight champion sitting on a rubber sheet. The sheet bends and curves under the weight, and the smaller objects nearby can't help but roll towards the heavyweight. Now, even though we can't see space's curves with our own eyes, we can see what happens to objects that get caught in its grasp. Getting pulled by gravity is like being caught in a whirlwind of forces. The caught object starts spiraling downward, just like a coin in those penny slot cyclone machines you find at tourist shops. Or it might move gracefully in circles, like bicycles racing around a velodrome track. Gravity is the primordial force that guides our entire world. Without it, there would be no stars, no galaxies, nothing. But where does it come from? Well, that's the million dollar question. And we don't have a complete answer just yet. But we do have some guesses. First of all, we know that gravity is more than just a feature of space. It's a force that pulls things together. Surprisingly, it's the weakest force among them all. But let's take a different look at gravity. Something that may surprise you. Instead of being a force that directly pushes or pulls objects from a distance, it's more like a dance. Gravity, as amazing as it is, doesn't perform alone in this dance. It shares the spotlight with other forces, like electromagnetism, for example. Let's imagine two electrons. There are dancers. Now, they don't directly push or pull each other like you might expect. Instead, one electron creates a special kind of field around itself, like an invisible force field. This field sets the stage for the show. The other electron senses this field and starts to twirl and interact with it. It's like they're following some choreography. And when we watch this dance, it looks as if the second electron is being pushed or pulled by the first one. But in reality, it's all about the intricate movements and interplay between the dancers and the field they're dancing in. The dancers never touch each other directly, but their interactions through these fields make it seem like they're connected. It's a magical display of fields and movements coming together to create the illusion of forces at play. The thing we call gravity. So even though it's not a force in the usual way, it behaves like one. We call it an emergent force, because it emerges or comes out from the way space and objects interact. Which is why, if we want to get technical, some scientists prefer to avoid the words gravitational force and opt for the term interaction. It's just a way for particles to mingle and exchange energy and information. Electromagnetic interactions, gravitational interactions, they're all part of this grand soiree. At least that's one of the theories. Some scientists also think that gravity might be made up of tiny particles called gravitons. These sneaky particles work behind the scenes, making objects attract each other. However, we haven't been able to directly see these elusive gravitons yet. So, according to this theory, gravity is both a force and a potential particle. As you can see, we have some struggles with explaining how gravity works on a large scale. But at least we have a good understanding of how it behaves in certain situations, like how planets orbit the sun, or how objects fall to the ground and stuff. But what happens when we zoom into the atomic scale? And what if we venture into the depths of black holes and the Big Bang? Now here's where gravity's wild ride goes off the rails. First, let's enter the realm of quantum mechanics. There's something peculiar that happens in this tiny world. Gravity, the force that pulls things together, seems to take a back seat. 
On a microscopic scale, other forces like electromagnetism take the spotlight and become the superstars. They're overshadowing gravity, and this leaves scientists scratching their heads, wondering, is this possible? Why does gravity suddenly fade away? So far, we have no idea. And when it comes to the grandest scales, where immense objects like black holes, gravity takes on a whole new level of complexity. For example, inside a black hole, laws of physics and gravity as we know them basically fall apart. It also decays when we try to understand how gravity behaved immediately after the Big Bang. Where did it even come from? We have no idea. In other words, we find ourselves in a cosmic fog when it comes to understanding gravity. But fear not. Scientists are working hard to learn more about this enigmatic emergent force. They're doing all sorts of experiments and using fancy technology to crack its code. Even though we still have a lot to figure out, we're making progress every day. For example, have you ever heard of gravitational lensing? It's like a mesmerizing magic trick. Imagine a beam of light as a fearless explorer, taking a straight path through the universe. But as it encounters the gravitational pull of a massive object, the light's journey becomes a wild roller coaster ride. The gravity of the massive object bends the fabric of space-time, creating a funhouse mirror effect. Our brave beam of light finds itself curving and twisting around the massive object, following a new unexpected path. But as the light changes its trajectory, it also reveals to us distant and hidden wonders that would have remained invisible otherwise. The light can magnify, distort, or even create multiple images of faraway objects. So all the things that have been playing hide and seek with us finally become visible, like black holes. There's also a mind-blowing idea called gravitational waves. Einstein predicted their existence tens of years ago, but only recently have we finally been able to confirm them. And that was a huge breakthrough in the science world. These waves carry the echoes of cataclysmic cosmic events, such as the collision of massive black holes or the birth of newborn stars. Just like dropping a pebble into a serene pond, these crazy events cause a ripple effect. But instead of water, it's space-time itself that ripples and warps. Scientists have just recently developed a way to listen to these whispers. They've created instruments capable of detecting these gravitational waves. These instruments, known as interferometers, are like ears that are finely tuned to catch the subtle vibrations of the universe. But one thing's for sure. Gravity is a superstar that shapes our universe. It keeps everything around us connected and rules our entire universe. The quest to unveil its ultimate secrets continues, and it's a thrilling adventure for scientists and curious minds alike. Legend has it that in the 17th century, Sir Isaac Newton noticed an apple fall from a tree and began wondering why the fruit had fallen to the ground and not upward or sideways. Well, that would be freaky. After years of studying, he concluded that gravity must be the culprit. The scientists called it a force of attraction that existed between all objects. But it was Albert Einstein, many years later, that revolutionized these ideas about gravity. Legend also has it that he wasn't completely satisfied with Newton's findings. Something just didn't seem right. As a young scientist, Einstein had some trouble formulating his theories, trying to explain the behavior of moving objects. When an experiment came to his mind, he called it the happiest of thoughts. Gravity feels like the sensation of riding in an ascending elevator. He called it general relativity. Einstein began working tirelessly, trying to prove this idea. At one point, he even complained he was on the brink of losing his mind. Now, in the simplest terms, general relativity claims that gravity is the curvature or warping of space. The greater mass an object has, the more it warps the space around it. Imagine a heavy ball resting on a trampoline. The rubber sheet under it gets warped under its weight. It's the same with our sun. It's big enough to twist space across the entire solar system. That's why our planet, as well as all the others, orbit around the star. This warping also impacts how we measure time. If you look at your watch, time seems to go by at the same rate every day. But if you hike to the top of a mountain and your friend wanders through a valley at the bottom of this mountain, you'll see that your watches will calculate time differently. One watch will tick faster, while the hands of the second one, which is traveling through the valley, will move more slowly. 
That's because gravity affects how fast time goes by. With these experiments in mind, Einstein concluded that gravity was not a force of attraction, but rather a curvature in the fabric of space-time. We feel gravity as a force simply because we're placed on some surface. If there was no surface and no attraction between us and this surface, we would become weightless. If you don't mind getting some weird looks, try this experiment. You'll need a bathroom scale and an elevator to ride. You'll soon see that your weight fluctuates as you move up and down in the building in the elevator. The gravitational force is the same, but your weight is different because the elevator speeds up and slows down. Aboard the International Space Station, astronauts literally move along with the station, so there's nothing to push them against the side of the station so that they have some weight. Even if we still think of gravity as a force, it's the weakest one we know. First of all, it only attracts. There's no negative counterpart that could push things away. And weirdly, even though this force is strong enough to keep galaxies together, we still overcome it every day. Every time you lift an object off the floor, you overcome the force of gravity produced by the entire Earth. Ooh. Just to paint a better picture, Earth's gravitational pull is weaker than the power of a refrigerator magnet. The fact that our planet has gravity also affects the way we look and act. All creatures on Earth are limited in growth by the height of their skeleton and by how much weight it can carry, which is directly proportional to gravity. That's why some marine creatures can grow bigger. The largest animal on our planet right now is the Antarctic blue whale. It's about the size of two school buses combined. That's because sea creatures can float, which slightly counteracts gravity. The effects of gravity can be seen in people, too. We are taller in the morning than we are in the evening. Our everyday activities and the added effect of gravity make the cartilage in our ankles, knees, hips, back, and neck compress. Once you have overnight rest, the cartilage swells back to normal. Gravity might also affect your shower routine. That is, if you're an astronaut. They have to rely on the old-fashioned way of bathing up there on the space station. They can't take a shower since the force of gravity up there is different and water doesn't flow as it should. Instead, they use liquid soap, water, and no-rinse shampoo. They first squeeze some liquid soap and water from pre-made water pouches onto their skin. Next, they open the no-rinse shampoo and add a little water to wash their hair. Towels are then used to wipe off the excess water, which is really precious in space. To make sure they recycle it, an airflow system quickly evaporates excess water. Gravity and weight shouldn't be confused. Astronauts on the space station do float, and you may sometimes hear that they are in the state of zero gravity. It's far from the truth, though, since gravity up there is about 90% of its value on our planet. But astronauts look and feel weightless, since weight is the force a certain object exerts on them back on Earth. Most creatures have evolved to sense and adapt to Earth's gravitational pull. In the sea, for instance, some fish have floating calcium carbonate deposits in their heads. Scientists call them ear stones, and they're pulled down by gravity. They act like a fish's internal compass. Now, plants have evolved to grow starch grains in the tips of their roots. They use this amazing feature to force their roots deep down into the soil. As little as we seem to understand it these days, we do need gravity for way more things than we can imagine. For instance, some bacteria become even more dangerous in space where there's little to no gravity. Salmonella, for example, the type of bacteria that is known to cause food poisoning, becomes three times nastier in the condition of microgravity. So you really gotta cook your chicken. Our own moon stays where it is because of the effects of gravity, too. If it weren't for this force, our satellite would have floated away by now. But it's held in place by Earth's gravitational pull. Objects with the biggest gravitational pulls in the universe are black holes. Thankfully, our planet is really far away from any of them. Nothing can escape the gravitational pull of a black hole, not even light itself. Similarly, gravity is different on each planet. And because of that, things weigh differently depending on which planet they're on. Take Earth, for example. An object that weighs 100 pounds here would only be 38 pounds on Mercury. But if you're planning on losing weight fast, try booking a trip to Pluto. 
someone who weighs 150 pounds on Earth would weigh no more than 10 pounds on Pluto. The same person would weigh considerably more on Jupiter, which is the planet with the most powerful gravity. 150 pounds on Earth would turn into more than 354 pounds there. Mm, no thanks. Remember that experiment with watches ticking at different levels of elevation? It turns out that gravity isn't spread evenly on the surface of Earth. Why? Because our planet isn't a perfect sphere. The mass of Earth isn't evenly distributed either. That's why you get variations in gravity in different locations. More so, gravity is weaker at the equator because of the centrifugal forces produced by the planet's rotation. Since we've always perceived gravity as a force, we seem to believe that it has somewhat of a suction motion. But it's not exactly true. Back in 1998, scientists were baffled to see that the expansion of the universe was speeding up. So they linked this to the repulsive gravity of mysterious dark energy. We now know that dark energy makes up for more than 60% of the mass energy of our whole universe. But since nobody knows what it actually is, we can only make assumptions. And one that's largely accepted is quantum theory, which seems to claim that gravity pushes rather than pulls things in. You got all that? I may need to watch this one again. An underwater earthquake opens a huge gap in the ocean floor. A large volume of water moves to fill the crack. At the same time, waves start to spread out from that point. They're just a foot high at first, but the closer they get to shore, the larger they become. When the waves reach shallow waters, they start to slow down. Their lower parts get to dry land first. This creates a vacuum effect that pulls the water away from the coast. The harbor and seafloor are visible now. And then, an enormous wall of water hits the shore. It wipes out everything in its path. Several minutes later, more waves usually arrive. Or it can be a landslide happening near a large body of water. Enormous amounts of forest, soil, and rock roll down into a lake or ocean, producing huge tsunami waves. Volcanic eruptions are responsible for 5% of the world's tsunamis. They can move great volumes of water and generate really big waves. Some tsunamis are caused by meteorites striking into our planet. If one of these red-hot space visitors strikes the ocean, the force of this collision displaces enough water to produce an extremely powerful tsunami. When a tsunami starts, its waves are usually just one foot high. That's what a small wave looks like. It comes up to the waist of the average person. Surfers call such rather big waves double overhead. The largest earthquake ever recorded happened near the coast of southern Chile. It triggered a tsunami that reached Hawaii, Japan, and the Philippines. The tsunami's largest wave was as tall as a five-story building. The largest wave ever surfed was half as tall as the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. Garrett McNamara set this record in 2011 in Nazaire, Portugal. In 1995, scientists proved the existence of rogue waves, sudden, unexpected swells. On that day, they saw an 84-foot wave. It was taller than the world's largest passenger plane, Airbus A380. The giant was surrounded by smaller, 20-foot waves. Tohoku tsunami waves in 2011 were generated by the strongest earthquake in Japan's recorded history. The highest wave was almost as half as tall as the Brooklyn Bridge. Krakatoa's volcanic eruption in 1883 produced the loudest sound ever heard on the surface of the planet. The highest tsunami wave the eruption formed was as tall as the Statue of Liberty. April Fool's Day tsunami in 1946 was triggered by a powerful earthquake near Alaska. The tsunami's highest wave was a bit taller than the Colosseum in Rome. The Boxing Day tsunami started in the Indian Ocean in 2004. It was caused by a powerful undersea earthquake. Its tremors produced a series of tsunami waves. The largest of them almost reached the height of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. One of the most disastrous landslides hit Lodolin Valley in Norway in 1936. An enormous piece of rock almost twice as large as the Eiffel Tower, broke loose and hurtled into Lovinet Lake. This caused an enormous tsunami wave. It was almost as tall as the Taj Mahal in India. 
2017 Greenland mega tsunami was triggered by a massive landslide at one of the fjords. The waves that flooded the shore reached the height of Big Ben. A powerful volcanic eruption caused a landslide from a 4,000-year-old lava dome. This set off Unzen Volcano mega tsunami. The largest wave was half as tall as the Space Needle in Seattle. Fogo mega tsunami happened 73,000 years ago when a part of the Fogo volcano collapsed into the sea. The mega tsunami's largest wave was as tall as the Washington Monument. When the upper 1,500 feet of Mount St. Helens exploded, it caused a massive landslide. A part of this avalanche plunged down into Spirit Lake. This caused a wave that was more than half the height of the Eiffel Tower. The Vejant Dam mega tsunami happened when a landslide dragged 9 billion cubic feet of forest, soil, and rock into the lake. A colossal wave overtopped the edge of the dam, taking out everything in its path. Its height was greater than that of the Golden Gate Bridge. A landslide in Lutuya Bay in Alaska formed a mega wave, one of the largest ever recorded. The mega tsunami surged over the headland, washing away trees, plants, and soil down to bedrock. The wave reached more than half the height of the Burj Khalifa, the tallest construction in the world. A third of the East Molokai volcano in Hawaii caved in and collapsed into the Pacific Ocean. This created a tsunami the size of the second tallest building in the world, Shanghai Tower. Imagine a world where instead of water, the oceans are made of methane. Yeah, that's right. Instead of swimming in H2O, you'd be paddling around in CH4. It's like Mother Nature's version of a fizzy drink. Such oceans actually exist on one of Saturn's moons called Titan. In fact, the methane and ethane on Titan play a similar role to the water on Earth. They cycle through the atmosphere and form clouds that eventually rain down onto the surface. They were discovered by the Cassini-Huygens space probe. And apparently, our entire planet's oil reserves could fit in one of Titan's puddles. Even the desert sand dunes on Titan have more organics than all of Earth's coal reserves. Who knew that Titan was the place to go if you're ever in need of fuel for your car? Now, obviously, there are some things that distinguish methane lakes from our water ones. First, the temperature on Titan is around negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. It's like taking a dip in a giant glass of liquid nitrogen. Not exactly ideal for a beach day, is it? Methane is also less dense than water, so if you were to go swimming in such an ocean, you'd float like a balloon. On the bright side, it would make doing the backstroke a lot easier. Next, while water waves can be pretty majestic, unfortunately, we can't ride any on Titan. Cassini didn't detect any big waves there. Maybe it's due to low seasonal winds, or the fact that some of the lakes are much smaller than Earth's lakes but we don't know for sure. Also, I know what you're thinking. If the oceans are made of methane, could you set them on fire? Technically, yes. Methane is a highly flammable gas. So if you were to light a match in a methane ocean, you'd get a pretty impressive, but dangerous, blaze. So, given all these differences, the question arises. What would a planet with such oceans look like? Well, we can make some guesses by looking at Titan. First of all, its atmosphere, composed primarily of methane, would be incredibly thick. Titan's atmosphere reaches nearly 370 miles into space, and the atmospheric pressure there is 60% greater than Earth's. So, if you ever wanted to experience the feeling of swimming super deep in the ocean, now's your chance. Also, Methane is a powerful greenhouse gas that traps the sun's heat really well. That's why our planet would warm up faster than a sauna. You may ask, why is it so cold on Titan then? This is because this moon is very far from the sun, and light doesn't reach it well. But if we place our planet somewhere in the middle, then the temperature may even be quite comfortable. Actually, methane oceans on a planet could really spice up the climate. 
the planet would be a breeding ground for methane clouds. Just like on Titan, it could form an orange-colored haze, or smog, that would make our planet look like a real mystery. It would be difficult to see us from space without some special telescopes. And let's not forget about methane storms. They would also occasionally drench the surface, so remember to bring your umbrella. But hey, at least the heavy, carbon-rich compounds would make for some pretty sweet dune fields. And finally, the most important difference. While water oceans on Earth are teeming with all sorts of creatures, we're not sure if there's any life in methane oceans on Titan. If there is, they'd have to be pretty tough to survive in such extreme conditions. So, if life on such a planet exists, it would be very different from what we're used to seeing on Earth. For example, microbes might be able to handle it. These tiny resilient creatures can survive in a wide range of environments, including extreme ones. So it's possible that microbial life could exist in methane oceans. And what about us and animals? Well, scientist Robert Zubrin thinks that Titan might be the perfect place for humans to colonize in our solar system. According to him, this little moon has everything we need to survive and thrive. And if it's possible on that moon, then it could work with a planet too. For starters, we'd need some oxygen to breathe. We could use nitrogen and methane in the atmosphere to create breathable air and rocket fuel. We could also use these elements to make some fertilizers and grow plants. Next up, we'd need water. Since the oceans are made of methane, we can't exactly drink them. We'd need to find or create sources of water. Scientists believe that it actually may be hidden below the surface on Titan, together with some ammonia. We could use it to drink or create even more oxygen. So with all of these resources, we could create a self-sustaining colony even in a place with methane oceans. Piece of cake. Although there are always alternatives. Maybe we could become methane breathers, evolve into organisms that use methane instead of oxygen. For example, we could get some large lungs because we'd have to inhale a much larger volume of air since methane is less dense than oxygen. But this is pure sci-fi. Methane oceans are not the only unusual oceans in space. It turns out that seas on diamond planets may be even weirder. Take WASP-12b, for example. This exoplanet, located about 1,200 light years away, might have oceans of tar. That's right, tar. The planet has more carbon than oxygen, which means its crust is probably made of things like diamond and graphite, instead of your average silica-based minerals like granite. Imagine stepping on this planet, and the first thing you notice is that the beaches are made up of black goo. It's like stepping into a nightmare, where you're trapped in quicksand made of sticky sludge. So forget about the sandy beaches and crystal clear water you're used to. Here, you'll be living the pitch life. Your swimwear will be replaced with hazmat suits, and you'll need a sturdy pair of boots to walk on the sticky surface. But in reality, WASP-12b is not the place to look for geology of any kind. It's simply too hot for anything to survive, let alone thrive. But there might be smaller, similar exoplanets where we could potentially live. Now, you might be thinking, tar oceans? Eh, that's crazy talk. But did you know that there's a 246-foot deep lake of natural asphalt here on Earth? It's called Pitch Lake, and it's located in Trinidad. It's formed when oil is forced to the surface, and the lighter components evaporate, leaving the thicker, heavier pitch behind. And guess what? This lake is home to a thriving ecosystem of microbes. So if you want to live on such a planet, at least you won't be alone. You'll have plenty of company in bacteria, fungi that love to feast on carbon found in asphalt, and archaea that live on methane. And finally, there are oceans of molten rock. That's right, 
Imagine a world where the floor is lava isn't just a game, but a reality. Welcome to 55 Cancri E, a planet so hot that the entire hemisphere facing its star is covered in magma. It's like a scene out of a heavy metal album cover. But don't worry, the other side of the planet is slightly cooler, so you can at least step off the lava and catch your breath. If you're feeling adventurous, you could always hop over to Koro T7b, another super Earth where the lava ocean is just a scorching. But this time, the night side doesn't offer much respite either. It's still seeing constant volcanic eruptions, like some sort of firework show. Scientists are scratching their heads trying to explain why these planets are so hot and why they haven't cooled down yet. Maybe they're just really good at retaining heat, or maybe they just have a bad temperament. Either way, it's probably best to stick to playing The Floor is Lava on solid ground and leave the real lava planets to someone else. All this diversity of oceans shows us that the universe is always full of surprises. It never ceases to amaze us with its creativity. Although these oceans are not suitable for human exploration, yet, they challenge our understanding of what could exist beyond our world.